Hello, everyone. We're calling to order, please. And I'll open with the statement of the Open Public Meetings Act. In compliance with the Open Public Meeting Act, adequate notice of this meeting of the Madison Historic Preservation Commission was provided by transmitting a copy to the Madison Eagle and the Morris County Daily Record, posting a copy on the bulletin board at the main entrance of Borough Hall, and filing a copy in the clerk office on January 9th, 2019. Copies of the notice were made available to members of the general public. Thank you. Um, for our first order of business. Um, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let us know when you're ready. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, just a, a roll call of the members here. John Forte, I know, is absent. Um, Janet Foster, I am here. David Luber, here. you have to speak. So, so we're here. Okay, John Solu, here. Carmine Toto, here. Chris Kellogg, here. Karen Jicey, here. Mary Ellen Lenahan, here. Jill Rhodes. Here. Okay. Um, we're all here, we have a quorum, we have members ready to go. Our first order of business, we have minutes from our meeting in January. As you know, we had no February meeting due to bad weather, and I had just passed out copies again. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look at them over the past couple months. Are there any other comments or corrections for our meeting of January 8th, 2019? No. Hearing none? A motion to approve. Second from motion from Jill, second from David. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And we will approve those minutes. Now we will turn to our main business for the evening, the application for redevelopment of the Madison Theater property on Lincoln Place. Vince? If I might, before we commence this meeting, uh, this is a meeting of the commission. I'm representing the board this evening, Vincent Lachlan, the commission. And I'd like to just explain what the hearing is about and the procedures that we will follow. This proceeding is required under the historic district ordinance of the borough of Madison. The applicant in this case has made a request for demolition of the structure on the property and presenting plans for a new structure to be built. I want to stress before the hearing commences that the commission does not have authority, ultimate authority, to decide what is built on the site, what particular improvements, or what the further and ultimate use of the property will be. The ordinance restricts the authority of the commission to make a report and recommendation to the planning board as to whether demolition, as the ordinance requires, and I'm using the language of the ordinance, as to whether demolition would be appropriate, and if it is, whether there would be conditions that the Commission would recommend and require in its report and recommendation that will be issued to the Planning Board. But I think it's appropriate and necessary before this hearing commences for everyone in the audience to understand that this is the first step. What happens after this hearing is concluded, whether it's this evening or whether it requires another hearing, will result in a report and recommendation of the Commission to the Planning Board as to the findings that the Commission makes this evening based on the presentation of the applicant and the burden of the applicant to show that demolition would be appropriate and that the design of the structure is appropriate and with whatever requirement that the commission would have for conditions that would apply for adaptive reuse of portions of the building or for design elements to be incorporated. But I think that's important for everyone to know before we start. Now, in the ordinance, there is a listing of requirements that apply to an application of this site. The applicant will be presenting expert witnesses and testimony. The board has retained consultants on the issue of structural integrity 
and the historic features and characteristics of the property that the commission may require be followed by the applicant or presented to the planning board for a further hearing and determination as to what would be appropriate to happen on the property. The way the hearing is going to proceed, if any of you folks are familiar with land use proceedings for a planning board or a board of adjustment, we're going to follow the same format, which is an accepted practice for public meetings. The applicant will make an opening statement through counsel. The applicant will present expert witnesses. The witnesses will testify. There'll be an opportunity for questions by the commission members, by the commission professionals, and for questions from the public. I must emphasize and stress that the ordinance requires that the commission take action on any application that's submitted, not just this case, which is, as I expect, going to be a little more involved since it requires testimony from experts and consultants. But the commission is required to resolve this application within 45 days, which would require a decision to be made by the end of March. Uh, as the commission goes forward with the hearing, there'll be an opportunity for questions. I want to stress for the public and, and for the residents that the time for statements and comments will be at the end of the hearing, not during the hearing to express opinions or what you'd like the commission to consider or what you'd like the commission to do. The commission can only make that decision at the absolute close of the hearing or hearings. There'll be an opportunity for public comment at the end of the presentation that the applicant makes before the applicant's attorney summarizes and it's presented to the commission for a decision. And again, that decision will be a report and recommendation of the commission that follows the requirements of the ordinance. I see a lot of folks here this evening. I ask for the, as the commission is going to have to be as efficient as we can be, I, I'm sure everybody is going to be as cooperative as you can, understanding there are a lot of people here tonight that would like to be heard and have an expression of their opinion or their belief or facts and information they'd like the commission to consider. I'd ask everyone to be mindful of the time constraints that apply. The hearing will proceed until a close, absolute close tonight, as I understand it, at 11 p.m. And testimony will be continued after 10.30, only as appropriate. So I, I'm happy to have the opportunity offered by the chair to give a purpose of the meeting, to understand the authority of the commission, which I think will guide your questions and comments, and understand, again, this is the first step of the process. The ultimate decision is going to be made on the use of this property by a further presentation the applicant will be making again to the planning board. There will be public hearings, and the decision maker on the app, absolute use and the structure that is maybe going to be built on this property is going to be the decision that's made after further public hearings that the planning board would conduct. Thank you very much. Okay, um, applicant, would you like to start? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairwomen, Commissioners. Can Com everyone hear? Commission professionals, I'm Peter Wolfson of Dave Pitney here on behalf of the applicant. The applicant is Saxon Real Estate, the owner and developer of uh, the proposed project. The property is uh, is known as 14 Lincoln Place. It's designated on the tax map as Block 2702, Lot 24. is located, of course, within the Civic Commercial Historic District and for zoning purposes within the CBD1 zone. The building is not a key contributor to the district, but is the last building at the edge of the district. Uh, as Mr. Lachlan indicated in the opening remarks, uh, we come to you pursuant to an application that's been made to the planning board for preliminary and final site plan. The applicant purchased the property in February of 2017. At that time, Bowtie Cinemas was operating the property as a movie theater. Bowtie, on its own terms, precipitously terminated the lease as it was no longer financially feasible to operate a theater at this site. The applicant proposes to demolish the existing structure and to construct a multifamily residential apartment building with ground floor retail and underground parking. The building will contain a total of 24 living units together with associated common and amenity spaces. Additionally, space is provided for a movie theater 
uh, and the applicant will make a, will continue its attempt to attract an operator for that space. Included within the 24 living units are four affordable units, which will help the borough meet its obligation as it finalizes its plans to settle its affordable housing litigation. As you will recall, the applicant has met twice with the, this commission already and has incorporated suggestions made at those meetings in its design. As Mr. Lachlan indicated, the applicant seeks uh, a recommendation from this commission to be made to the planning board on the site plan application together with a certificate of historic review in connection with the demolition and the proposed new building. The historic preservation ordinance has seven purposes and objectives, many of which will be addressed tonight. Preliminarily, purpose B of the ordinance is to, quote, foster private reinvestment in the historic district and sites and balance the purposes of historic preservation with current needs. The applicant is a private entity making an investment in the historic district to develop a building with historic characteristics, but that incorporates modern features and provides uses sorely needed within the downtown district. Purpose E is to, quote, maintain and promote an appropriate and harmonious setting for existing historic resources within the borough. The new building has been designed to maintain the historic character of the district and is harmonious with and complementary to other district buildings. Purpose G is to, quote, encourage new construction, which is in keeping with the character of historic districts and sites. The new building maintains the historic character of the district while incorporating, again, sorely needed uses to the downtown area. With me tonight, I have a number of witnesses. I have Anthony Rinaldi, who is a representative of the owner developer Saxum. He'll provide some very brief comments. Then I have Wayne Hostetler, a structural engineer from Thornton Tomasetti, who will speak to the building's structural compromise and the inescapable conclusion by Saxum to demolish and rebuild. Then Jeff Gertler, the project architect of Gertler and Wente Architects. He will review the proposed building uh, and uh, the consistency with the civic commercial design guidelines, as well as to uh, highlight the suggestions that have been incorporated as made by the commission in the prior meetings. Finally, Robert Kornfeld, historic preservation architect from Thornton Tomasetti. He too will confirm that the existing building is not architecturally significant and that the proposed building will harmonize and complement the historic district and is consistent with the Madison Civic Commercial Design Guidelines. So with that, that concludes my opening statement. Um, I, I'm aware of five reports having been generated in connection with this discussion tonight, three of which were generated by the applicant, two of which were generated by the, the commission's experts. If it pleases, we agree. If it pleases the commission, um, perhaps we can just uh, mark these and uh, put them in the record. Uh, we can mark the first three, A123 and B1 and 2. The okay. board res uh, reports are from the board's consultants, Mr. McManus and Mr. Hatch. Is that correct, counsel? That is correct. Thank yep. You. So I appreciate I'll, being supplied with the applicant's reports as well. Thank you. I have them here. I'll mark A1, the Tom, uh, Th Thornton Tomasetti report. Uh, and this is the historic architect, Mr. Kornfeld. I'll mark A2, also Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, prepared by Wayne Hostetler is the structural engineering report. And this commission has already seen, although we submitted these reports, had earlier seen before the prior sessions a May 4, 2018 report by Persimmon Engineering. I'll mark that A3. And then for the board expert reports, there is an expert with, uh, report of Clark, Caton, and Hintz. And that is by Mr. John D.S. Hatch. Uh, and that is dated March 5. I'll mark that B1. And then the fifth and last is the board's structural condition report submitted by McManus Design Group, Inc., prepared by John McManus and John Deng, PE, dated February 11, 2019. And I'll mark that B2. If I can approach the dais, I'd Thank you. leave these. Appreciate with you. it, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to call Anthony Rinaldi of Saxon to make a brief statement. Mr. 
Mr. Rinaldi, would you raise your right hand, please? Sure. Do you swear that the testimony you offer to the hearing of the commission is the truth and nothing but the truth shall be wrong? Yes, I do. For our record, give us your full name, spell your last name, and your business address, please. Uh, Anthony Rinaldi, spelled R-I-N-A-L-D-I. Our business address is 359 Springfield Avenue in Summit, New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Thank you. All right, so uh, hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anthony Rinaldi. I'm the founder and managing principal of Saxon Real Estate. As now all of you are aware, we are the owners of 14 Lincoln Place, formerly known as the Madison Movie Theater. Um, I first want to thank all the folks who have joined us for this meeting. Uh, I know people's time is precious, so to spend it here in uh, this church with us is, is meaningful. Uh, to the HPC, thank you for your time. I think this is now the third time we, we've sat in front of you. And we appreciate the time I'm sure it's spent taken to review the application, as well as the municipality who continues to uh, work with us through this process. Um, and this process, candidly, has been challenging. We face many hurdles, some of which have been under our control, others which have not. Uh, however, we've continued to make progress and are excited about this project. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that this project, it's been ongoing for two years, uh, and it means a great deal to Saxon, myself, and my team. Uh, the town of Madison great, means a great deal to me personally. My wife went to St. Vincent's. My family has a business here. My wife and mother work right here in the downtown. My in-laws live here. My investors, my friends, my partners live here. I live in the neighboring community and in all likelihood will send my kids to high school here. Uh, because of that care, we have worked tirelessly on this project. We have spent more time on this project than some projects that are 10 times the size. We are ex extremely proud of the project team we've put together, including local Jeff Gertler, who sat on the HPC and planning board in the past. Uh, as well as the rest of the team, and we're excited to hopefully see this project move forward. Um, I think it's important to note you know, a few things. Uh, I, Peter did mention, and we never, uh, when we initially bought the building, we did not have intention of vacating Bowtie. They, voted, they vacated on their own with an average viewers of only 14 people per showing. Uh, they abruptly gave us notice to vacate. Um, you know, in addition to that, you will hear from our design professionals as well as other, others that the building is structurally compromised poses life safety concerns and health issues associated with mold and asbestos, and we have the right, and Saxon maintains the right to demolish the building and intends to. You know, in terms of what we are proposing, we are proposing 24 apartments above street level retail, and this includes space for a new movie theater operator. The proposed building is uh, less than two feet taller than the existing structure and provides parking for residents within the building. We've also included a small movie theater in an attempt to address the concerns of the residents, which we've heard. Uh, we, our proposal includes contributing four affordable units, which uh, I, it's important to note the importance of that given that every state has, every town has a, a mandate within the state to meet those affordable requirements and Madison has yet to do so. Uh, this development is, gener is estimated to generate over $6 million in additional tax revenue over the next 20 to 25 years. And I'm sure many Madison residents would, uh, would agree that they, I hear them often complain about taxes and hopefully this project will somewhat alleviate that. So uh, while there's been a clear voice uh, by some against the development of this, of this site, there's strongly, equally strong a sentiment of support. Some may disagree with the best path forward. However, there's clear consensus among the residents in their desire to see the borough of Madison flourish, and we share in that desire. Those in support of this project recognize the changing times and have witnessed many of their favorite local businesses close over the years. New buildings bring much needed life and economic support to a downtown. The types of residents living in these apartments historically allocate the largest amount of their discretionary incomes in spending money within their communities. Their residency dramatically improves the walkability and creates much needed foot traffic that supports the local businesses. The high quality experiential retail that we plan to deliver will help to further enhance Madison as a destination, bringing in local foot traffic and patron, patrons from many other areas to support local shops and restaurants, all of which will further enhance the walkability of the downtown and contribute to the vi vibrancy and success of this great community. So with all that said, I, uh, I encourage everyone here, whether it's people against uh, you, that are for saving the theater or not, to deeply consider this project and determine whether you want to hold on to the past which has not worked or push forward towards the future and help usher in downtown Madison in the 21st century, ensuring its viability and success for generations to come. Thank you. Well done, sir. Oh, sure. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Rinaldi? Anybody on the commission? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Public. Excuse me, I'm sorry. 
I didn't. I didn't know we were going to do it this way. Okay. I just had questions. Anybody from the public have any commission, questions for Mr. Rinaldi? Yes. One in the back. Well, or come forward with yep. your name. Please. So you're comfortable in Come forward, please, yes. And yes, next person can come up and stand there, too. Thank you. Please say your name and address. Hi, Dan Myers. Um, actually, Maplewood. Um, Maplewood, okay. Um, but wondering how large, is, how large is the proposed... Maplewood. Uh, 125 Donnell Road. Thank you. How large is the proposed movie, new movie theater in the development project going to be? How many seats? Well, it's actually, there's two configurations. One is 100. Yes, certainly. Well, but that will, that will be, later. do you have any questions for Mr. Rinaldi? Because that will be discussed later. Yeah, we'll have our architect speak to that question. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Please give your name and address, please. James Gilbert. I live in Chatham Township. Yes, certainly. Go, Kevin. Um, I have street a address, please, sir. Excuse me? Street, street address. address. Your home address. 30 Oak Hill Road. Thank you. Um, I think I heard you, Mr. Rinaldi, say that this project is only feasible if you get a variance. For an extra floor, is that? We have a number of variances. Yeah, which would be approximately a 20% increase, something Excuse like me. that. Yeah. I think it's important that we stay relevant. I understand. Testimony yes. And also to what we're here to do tonight. Okay. Um, I think what it is is we're going to talk about certain issues. Um, and that is not the issue for tonight. But tell me what your concern is, and I'll see if we can. My, my concern is clarifying how much of a variance the town taxpayers will have to give to make this project okay. viable. I would have to respond if I could. Yes. I tried, sir, to indicate that this commission is not permitted to go into the details of what's going to be built. We are confined to a review of the application request for demolition, whether it would be approved with or without conditions. Any variances that the applicant is required, I don't know what they are because I'm not sure if they've been reviewed yet by the planning board. Planning board must await the decision and recommendation report of this commission. So it's not appropriate legally to ask this gentleman that question about variances. Okay, thank you. We don't have the authority, I'm sorry. Thank you. Any other questions directly to Mr. Rinaldi on what he just spoke yeah. about? We do have other applicants. Witnesses. Uh, Joseph Falco, Delwood Drive. Mr. Rinaldi, you said tonight that uh, it's Delwood under. Drive, Chatham? Madison. Madison. The Rose City. Madison. That's correct. Yes, sir. Thank you. It was mentioned that the building is on the, one of the corners or at the end. Do you realize in the historic map there are actually nine, possibly ten corners to the historic district? It's like a big polygon. Just want to point that out. There's a lot of edges to it, including this building, the Catholic Church the James Building, the Burnett Building. It's kind of like a, an amorphous end. So if you just want to point that out. Yeah. Can, can we just ask that they be questions? That was a question. I asked them if they realized that they were words. That was a question. We, we lawyers use an expression, asked and answered. It's over. The, your question was there. Your statement was made. You got it. If we could, folks, understand the questions only. Based on the testimony of Mr. Rinaldi, there will be other witnesses who are going to talk about the plans that the applicant has submitted and the request of the applicant, which is actually before the commission, which is whether or not the commission would approve demolition with or without conditions. Thank you. I'm Bonnie Monty. I've been a Madison resident for 29 years, and I work 16 Page Street in Madison, uh, and I work in Madison as well. Uh, I'm not sure if this question is appropriate because all the questions so far have been, we've been told they're not appropriate. But you spoke of the, um, the aesthetic of this building matching to some ex or, or mirroring the, the, uh, the, the character of the historic district in Madison, yes? But what I'm looking at is a white model that feels extremely modern. I can't tell what the... Mr. Monty, Ms. Monty, I'm sorry. 
there will be an expert on um, Excellent. This the structure. question is then not yes. appropriate. Okay. okay. It's very unclear as, to, as okay. to what you want us. I mean, he did speak about it. He did. He, exactly. Okay. So, so that's we're, why I'm So we're clear, most respectfully to you, yes. ma'am. The questions are related to the testimony of that witness. It's going to be supplemented with details of the building as exists, its condition, what is proposed by the applicant, again, understanding the commission does not approve the ultimate design and construction of this building. So restrict yourself, please, to the testimony of this gentleman. Thank you. I apologize. I was asking a question that I thought did apply to his testimony. Thank you. It will come. Yes. Good evening, Deborah Fennelly, 88 Constitution Way, Convent Station, formerly a resident of Madison. Uh, Mr. Rinaldi used the term very quickly, but I caught it nonetheless, not architecturally significant. I was wondering if you could define that or if it will be defined. Is that subjective? Is that a summary? Is that an opinion? You have to ask this gentleman the question. It's I'm asking him. I'm question. trying to have my voice heard by the microphone. I think he knows I'm addressing it to him. Um, you'll hear testimony from our architects and our historic architects that I think this building is in, uh, historically significant. I could say Excuse I'm, me, did you just say you, you think it isn't historically I think That's that your opinion. <coughs> okay, that, I just want to make sure that that's not, your opinion. I do not believe it's historically Okay, so that's an opinion statement that is not based on... Ma'am, I'm going to ask you as the legal officer of the board, questions, you can't add commentary or whether you agree with him. I'm just asking question and answer. I heard question, your question sir. most respectfully. As legal officer of the board, I'm asking you to limit your questions to what he says, and that's his answer. I'm Thank making you. sure I understand his answer. What you're telling me is that is your opinion of this building. Yep, and I probably Thank you. Could you, uh, Betty Blank, 125 Greenwood Avenue, a resident for 48 years in Madison, um, could you put a picture of the front of the building up? I saw one, I don't know, one of the first meetings, and it was not a total obscenity, but it did not fit in the character of Madison. So that would be brought up. Uh, uh, and you'll see the, our presentation will okay. be Okay. Tonight? Yes. Ms. Blaine. Right, right after this conversation. Okay, good. Yeah. There, on Greenwood Avenue, they knocked down three or four build, little houses, put up yes. an obscenity of question, a building. Question to, yeah, to him. It completely changed the character. I was at the meeting where I saw what you proposed, the four-story, it didn't look anything like Madison, and uh, that's... I'm sorry, Ms. Lang. What yeah. is your specific question to Mr. Rinaldi about the, the short presentation he just made? Okay, sorry. I, I would like to see the picture, not just that. I'm sure we, okay. we all will. Oh, good. We all Thank will you. see pictures and plans and discuss that further. Thank you. Any other public comment directly related to what Mr. Rinaldi quest questions? Thank you. Yes, questions. Specific questions related to what Mr. Rinaldi just presented about. Hey, how are you? This. I'm Andy, <coughs> Andy Breckman. I live on Green Hill Road here in Madison. I'm also a member of the Save Madison Theater organization. Uh, I believe it was Peter, not yourself, sir, <coughs> in his very first statement. The very first uh, sentence that uh, referred to the building as quote not a key contributor. To the district. That's a quote. I wonder if you could name a building in this town that you would consider a key contributor to the district if the Madison Theater is not one. Can you yourself name one that you would consider? What is the James building? Re re respectfully, I made it in my opening statement. I'm That's sorry. not testimony. We have a historic architect who is an expert and has studied the district. Uh, it's a term of art and historic preservation. Some buildings within a historic district are contributing and some are considered key. This Mr. Wilson, I'm going to respectfully ask you not to continue that discussion. There was nothing wrong with your question, sir. Do you have any further? There was, I, nothing, I, wrong, I, there was I, nothing wrong with that question so because there is you made a, a statement. So there is a building, this James building, that you would not renovate or tear down or you would, you would hope would be renovated if someone threatened it. There's a building out there that you feel attached to in Madison. Not this building, not the movie theater. There's a building called the James Building that you would fight for. It's a key contributor to the district, in your opinion. 
It must be a wonderful building. I hope to see it soon. Yeah, you sir, got to give him a chance All to right. answer. Okay, thanks. Well, it's not an opinion. I'm stating that what I believe to be a key contributing building here in downtown. You asked me what a key contributing building is. That is. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Wesley Friedman from Madison. Wesley. 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 Street address, please. Uh, 25 Green Ave. Thank you. I'd just like to know if you could define in your terms what um, historically significant is, since you used those terms. I think it, it's a good question. Uh, so I think that's left up to somewhat of an opinion. Um, you, if you see the building, in my opinion, in the front of the building, it has a very utilitarian design. It wasn't designed to have significant architectural importance. Uh, there's nothing truly interesting about the front facade. Uh, and I think those are the types of things that are what defines it as, as a significant architectural. Ar architecturally, but with all due respect, what does that have to do with the history of the building? As In terms of history, historically the, significant. I, I was answering Does it matter to you that it's been standing for over 90 years and has served the community in a historical way? I think you'll hear from our professionals that the building is structurally compromised um, and that it, it needs to come down. It's not economically feasible to rebuild. And as somebody who owns a half a dozen truly historical buildings in this state, I, I actually can opine on what buildings that we believe are historically significant and spend millions of dollars saving versus a building that is economically challenged we do not have the ability to, from an economic point of possibility, saving the building, and we don't. We personally don't believe the architecture is that Thank you, Rob Pratt. <clears throat> Rob Pratt, twenty-five Sherwood Avenue. Sorry, what was the last name? Pratt, P R A T T. And the address again? I'm sorry. Twenty-five Sherwood Avenue. Madison. 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 I was noting how you were reading from the purposes of the Historic Commission of how this building meets those purposes. Mm -hmm. And the very first one, though, is to promote the use of historic districts for the education, pleasure, and welfare of the citizens of the borough and its visitors, and to promote civic pride in the borough historic resources. Do you think this building will be able to meet those criteria? That was a statement from our council. Oh, sorry. Thank you. We have lots of other witnesses and lots of other opportunity to question. Is this maybe our last question for Mr. Rinaldi? If you all have questions for Mr. Rinaldi, line up so we can judge this. And I would add maybe we should try to, in the interest of moving along, um, keep your questions and comment period to three minutes. We'll try to... One minute. Re brevity is the soul One of wit, Mrs. Tom. Foster. One minute, right. Mrs. Foster. Tom Harlan Buddhist, 27 Pomeroy Road, Madison, New Jersey. I'm sorry, what was the last name? H-A-R-A-L-A-M-P-O-U-D-I-S. <laughs> and the address? 27 Pomeroy Road in Madison. So, Mr. Rinaldi, you, you stated you work for the Saxon development company and your partners with Hollister uh, Construction Group, you guys have extensive experience with historic and distressed properties in the state, don't you? Yes. So based on your experience, would this have been one of the most challenging buildings for you to preserve? Yes. Okay. Another question. Do you know when the building went up for sale? It was up for sale. I think it actually started at the end of 2015, if not 2016, and it was on the market for over 12 months before we purchased it. Well, it was more than 12 months. It was September of 2015, and I was following it all along. And Sir, now until I you have can to swear you. You want me to leave? No, I don't want you to leave. You just have to procedurally be sworn, because oh. you're making statements of what you believe to be facts in your question. So it has well, to it be was under for oath. Sale on September I'm not 2015. You'll get back to it in a oh, second. Sorry, sorry. Just procedurally, yes, you sir. have to be sworn. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth in this hearing before the board? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So the building was for sale for approximately 16 months, 17 months. And there was nobody that approached you while, when they found out that you were trying to buy the building? Nobody to preserve it. To preserve it as a theater? 
we didn't, you know, the, the building was uh, publicly and widely marketed. No one really stepped up uh, to be able to purchase the, the building. Uh, we ended up obviously purchasing the building. And, uh, you know, we, like I said before, we anticipated keeping bow tie for the time being, and they ended up noticing the big. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sandy Kolakowski, 136 Park Avenue, KOL, aka OWSKI. You stated that no one else was interested in the building. Didn't the gentleman that was just here bid for the building and get outbid by you? They, he, no one was interested. No one was interested in purchasing it at the purchase price that the sellers were only willing to sell it for, which is how we clearly won that. C clearly. That's true. That's always true. If you wait long enough, another buyer may have come forward. But you outbid buyers within Madison that actually wanted to give it a try as a movie theater. Is that correct? Uh, I would, on behalf of the organization that Tom was putting together, they determined it wasn't financially feasible, and it was which is why they didn't move forward with the project. I understand that, but there were there was other interest. Not and. And you outbid them for because your intention was not to keep it as a movie theater, but instead to use it as a property that you wanted to redevelop. Actually, uh, I know there are other people who offered much more than us, but we had developed a relationship with the owners, and they ended up selling us the building. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to call Wayne Hostetler, our structural engineer. You raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear that the testimony and any evidence or report you offer to the commission in this hearing will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Help God. Yes. Give us your full name, spell your last name, and your business address for the record, please. Wayne Hostetler, H O S. T-E-T-L-E-R, business located at 744 Broad Street in Newark. Wayne, just for the benefit of the commission as well as the public, can you give a brief uh, description of your education uh, and professional background and qualifications? Sure. Um, I graduated from Cornell University with a degree in st structural engineering, uh, master's degree in structural engineering from Columbia University. I've been working at Thornton Tomasetti, a multidisciplinary um, group of engineers, architects, and other professionals for nearly 30 years doing structural design, uh, structural evaluation, evaluation of various building uh, conditions and uh, uh, problems in order to write um, reports of recommendations and also to design uh, adaptive reuse or to design the various sorts of uh, fixes that may be required with existing building problems. And do you hold any professional licensures? I do. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of New Jersey as well as in New York. Okay. And you, you heard at the beginning of the session that we marked uh, five reports, including yours, into the record? Yes. Okay. And one of those was prepared by McManus Design Group, the HPC's consultant, dated February 11, 2019. Did you have a chance to review that report? Yes, I did. And are his findings consistent with yours? Yes. And then uh, you, of course, prepared a report which has also been placed in the record, correct? Correct. Okay, and that's dated February 8, 2019? Yes. Okay, and in connection with your retention to opine on the structural uh, condition of the building, uh, did you have an opportunity to inspect the existing building? Yes. And while you're inspecting the building, did you take photographs? Yes, I did. And during your inspection, did you come to the conclusion that the existing building is structurally compromised? Yes, I did. Okay. We have a PowerPoint uh, presentation that a number of our witnesses are going to be referring to. We'll offer a copy of that to the commission at the end. Perhaps we can mark that for the record now as A4. Uh, and I think that Wayne is going to be referring to some photos in there. That sounds fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so going through the pictures that you took of the existing building, can you please describe to the commission what each picture depicts 
and what would be required to make the existing structure safe and into compliance with applicable codes. Sure. Okay, I'm just going to walk you through a number of photographs of conditions that I observed while visiting the facility. Um, they're at various portions of the building and, and representative of various conditions. The, uh, the theater building has a sloped roof portion. It's about three quarters of the length of the building. Uh, and then a flat roof portion in the front. We're looking at a photograph at the sloped roof. Um, it's supported by structural steel trusses, roof trusses, that are approximately 17 feet apart from one another. And the roof is constructed between the trusses with uh, wood joists and uh, a, a, a framing that goes over top that supporting the uh, shingling. One of the things that I noticed when I was there is that the, there's, a, there's an accessible space within that truss space and the wood joists are sagging rather significantly. Um, we noticed one that was cracked and it was pretty obvious condition. So back at the office we took a look at the uh, structural capacity ran some calculations and determined that for code loads, uh, carrying the weight of snow, carrying the weight of the self weight of the roof, it also has um, rods that are supporting the original um, plaster ceilings. And under all those loads uh, prescribed by code, the existing joists that span that 17 feet are, are overloaded. Um, and I think that's the reason why we're seeing the sagging. So to correct that condition and bring it up to code and make it safe, uh, there's really no other way to address it economically other than removing and replacing the wood portion of that structure. You'd have to brace the trusses. You would need to um, either remove the plaster ceiling that's suspended below or temporarily support it, put the wood back in place, and then resupport the ceilings. So we can advance to the next slide. At the flat roof portion of the facility, on the second floor, there's space um, that's wood with wood frame floors. The roof also is uh, wood framed. And we no I noticed uh, quite a number of locations where water had entered the building and the floors as a result, and possibly the roofing, although it's not accessible, uh, have warped or sagging or displaced uh, floor floorboards. To correct that concern, you would need to inspect the conditions throughout and uh, selectively remove and replace um, any floorboards that are uh, a hazard with respect to being too soft or deflected. Okay, can advance to the next. Um, I spent quite a bit of time looking at the exterior of the building. Three sides of the building, uh, the photo that right here, we're looking at the east side, where, for the sake of my presentation anyway, north it. North is facing towards the uh, rear of the theaters, and the street would be on the south side. So this is on the east. Uh, the rear and the uh, west side are similar. Um, a notable condition on the east side is that there's some significant cracks that go diagonally through the uh, exterior walls. The exterior walls are bearing walls uh, at pier locations underneath the trusses that I mentioned earlier. And then at the flat roof portion of the building, there's also bearing walls that support the, the flooring and the roof. Um, the, the cracked conditions are indicative. You can advance through uh, another one or two. I think I have a few that show these diagonal cracks. They're indicative that there is likely settlement of the foundations underneath these portions of the structure. Um, if you go a slide or two further, you'll see that one more. There's a portion of the foundation on the interior. It's a concrete foundation that's visible in one of the crawl spaces that has a, a significant crack through the footing. Um, in order to rectify these concerns, you would need to investigate the soil conditions underneath to determine whether or not the settlement has continued or if it's uh, stopped at this point. If it's continuing, you'd want to stabilize it with some sort of uh, measure like mini piles, perhaps, or uh, injecting a grout underneath to stiffen the soil. Regardless of whether or not it's uh, stable, in, in any case, once you either stabilize it or determine that the foundation is stable, you would have to go and selectively remove and replace masonry uh, where it's significantly cracked because the piers act structurally to support the roof trusses 
and the entire building is stabilized uh, laterally by these exterior masonry walls. Okay, again, that's the next. Towards the front portion of the building, there's uh, some bearing walls, I believe I mentioned, that support the flooring and the roofing adjacent to the same side of the building with the east, where I just mentioned that uh, cracking and uh, settlement. We see other cracks inside the building and the bearing walls of similar types of conditions. So those are indicative of the same concerns that would be addressed in a similar manner. With these interior walls, uh, to remove and replace portions of it selectively, you'd have to temporarily support the uh, flooring that they support with shoring and so forth, do the repairs, and then you can restore the support of the floors. There's also locations where the existing walls on the exterior are displacing outward, or they show cracks. Um, this is looking from the uh, looking at the west side of the building toward at the front, and the the front elevation of the building is is pulling outward to some extent. That's the photo on the right. The photo on the left shows an interior perpendicular partition wall against an exterior, and it's separated. These are indicative that there's insufficient um, tiebacks of the ex exterior walls to the floor systems to make sure that they don't move. You advance to the next slide as well. There's also horizontal cracks that go through these piers that we've observed at certain conditions, certain locations. And again, since these piers are structural, you would need to investigate those further and possibly reinforce them to make sure that they are uh, not bowing outward and that any cracks that are developing horizontally are not a significant structural concern. Or if they are, you need to repair them. The last series of slides that I have relate to the conditions of the exterior walls themselves. Um, the vast majority of the wall openings consisting of uh, windows or louvers or doors have corroded reinforcing steel lintel angles on top of them. To fix that concern, you would need to re locally remove masonry above the lintels and either clean and paint them if they're in good enough condition or replace them. And then you can re put the masonry back. Can you advance to the next slide, please. There's also a large scope of existing brick behind uh, the coating that's been put on the, on the, on the wall that are deteriorating, eroding, um, spalling, and the joints are uh, deteriorating as well. In order to address that concern, you need to remove and selectively replace a brick that is severely eroded and deteriorated. Um, the coating itself that's on the, on the exterior of the, of the walls should be removed and replaced because it's failed throughout. If for structural, to address it structurally, you could leave a certain amount of deterioration on the bricks and put back material in another coating to protect it. If for other reasons, architectural or aesthetic, you would want to leave the brick exposed, there would be a significant scope of brick that had to be removed and replaced because of the erosion and deterioration of it. Okay, can you advance one more? Just some shots of what the building looks like generally from the outside. And then the next one, I believe, shows at the uh, foundation level there's concrete that is um, cracked and spalling. Uh, that also would have to be locally uh, removed and replaced, valid conditions with concrete. Okay. So Wayne, based on your review of the existing structure, the relevant building codes and applicants' plans for the, for the property, what would be required to rehabilitate the existing structure and renovate it into the proposed mixed-use building? Okay. Um, so it's a theater structure. It's very distinct with respect to how it's configured. It has a... Could you advance it forward one more, please? Uh, what we're looking at actually is a cross-section of the proposed structure, but just for the sake of explaining some of what's involved to adapt it to a different use, I, I, I thought that would be a good photo to look at or diagram. So the existing uh, facility has a sloped ground level floor. Portions of it are higher and portions of it are lower than the uh, grade level in order to use for the theater use. 
it has a, in the front end of it, it has a second floor and then a flat roof, and in the back end it has a sloped roof. Now, in, in addition to having to address concerns with the existing structure, if you were to adapt it to the use that's proposed, you would have to remove a very large scope of the existing structure in order to install the configuration of what's proposed um, with the multiple levels, with um, the, the, the roof not, the levels just don't line up. So essentially you'd have to remove the interior walls, you'd have to remove the sloped floor, you'd have to remove the flat roof, you'd have to remove the sloping roof, you may be able, from a configuration standpoint, to keep some of the exterior walls, but the exterior walls are, serve as structure. They don't have any structural concrete or structural steel within those walls or masonry, and they're in poor condition. So you'd have to selectively remove and replace a large scope of those to be able to serve as some sort of support for the proposed structure. Uh, it would be much more practical and economical to remove and replace the structure. Based on your conclusion that the building is structurally compromised and the substantial cost that would be required to bring the existing building uh, in, into use for the proposed mixed use, do you find it to be a logical decision to demolish the building? Yes. That's it. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, in your report, you covered three things. What were they? In my report, I covered three things? Yes. I thought... Some of you refer to report. Certainly. Sure. I summarized um, and evaluated the conditions. Mm -hmm. Existing building. Okay. Right, the existing. I described what would be required to restore the building for its current use and configuration, and then I described what work would be required to alter the building to the proposed mixed use. Okay, thank you. Any questions from anybody on the commission? Jill, uh, Ms. Rhodes. Why don't we just pass, pass it down? Hi, um, so much ado has been made about the cracks in the external brick. Um, my understanding is that the infrastructure of this building is actually terracotta tiles. So if the bricks are just an external veneer, how accurately would all those cracks you keep showing us demonstrate any meaningful internal structural damage? Well, there's a few things. With the original, the, the photos that we have up here that show the diagonal ones through the wall, the interior side also shows the cracks diagonally through the terracotta. So that's... How come you don't have any photos of those? Oh, uh, I do. do. If you advance to there, that's the, in, that's the interior side on the right. Uh, well, they're both interior. The one on the left is covered with plaster. They're terracotta. Um, did I answer your question? Um, well, I mean, that's the, one example. Well, you, so well, you, asked, you asked about the uh, structure being primarily terracotta as opposed to brick. Yeah. Uh, there are some, there's a significant portion of the structure that is brick. The roof trusses are supported by brick piers. The terracotta actually runs continuously as a, as a certain thickness. I think it's... Um, is it on all floors or is it... Yeah, well, it's the full height. Because I know a lot of... So my context for this, I have a brick house that right. had significant cracking. And I was told it's simply an external veneer and shows no real damage to the structure. So I'm just questioning to what degree all of those cracks legitimately show structural damage versus just being an external veneer. Right. Um, the main ones for the terracotta are the concerns with the settlement. And but the, the brick piers also support the uh, roof trusses. So those are structural as well. Thank you. You did walk through a list of items that describe the um, deterioration of the um, structure. Of those, what is the more critical and would be the most difficult, expensive uh, to remediate? There's a, the, the two that come to mind are the settlement concern. 
um, in order to investigate and determine what's happening with the soils and whether the settlement has ceased or not, and then addressing any existing ongoing concerns with that, with the soil, and then having to selectively remove and replace portions of the wall that have been significantly cracked by the settlement. The other is the, uh, the roof construction and having to remove and replace portions of the roof construction. During your uh, presentation for the east exterior wall, you referred to potentially a, a way of repairing the, um, the structure um, by applying mini piles and uh, grouting the foundation. What are the challenges associated with that kind of a procedure? Well, there's, there's, um, there's, there's companies that specialize in that sort of work. So first there would be an investigation to determine whether that's required. Um, is your question as to how to go about doing it in the facility? Yeah. Um, you'd have to get, get some information about how the foundation is configured. Portions of it may be on the outside, portions of you know, spread footing, uh, the thickness of the wall. Um, so there may be some challenges trying to get the support uh, from access on the outside if there's also things they have to do on the inside, bringing equipment in to handle some of the interior walls that may be settling to address it in the interior as well. Thank you. Yeah, I have another one. Um, you described the out-of-plane displacement and cracking of the exterior walls, and you state that they should be stabilized as required by adding anchors and reinforcing the brick piers. I'm not a structural engineer. What are they, what is the anchors, and what, is that, what does it take to do that? Uh, so the masonry walls are often constructed where at a corner the, um, the course work would be interlocked. Uh, I don't know if it was done that way for this particular structure, but that often will hold the walls together to one another. Um, with construction of this age, it, it may have relied on we call it composite action of the various portions of the masonry uh, being interlocked with one another. The way you address it currently, though, is you'd likely drill some holes, install threaded rods with an adhesive and epoxy or that sort of thing that would go through both uh, sides of the separation to hold them together once installed at some spacing. So that could tie masonry to masonry, but you could also do anchors of um, connecting it to the floor or the roof construction in, in, a, in a matter, in, in that case it'd likely be from the inside, where you'd have to fasten perhaps an angle at some spacing to the, the wood construction and then drill into the masonry and install again with uh, adhesives or an epoxy to anchor the masonry to an angle to the wood. Yes. Um, the two by tens that you witnessed up in the, uh, the gable roof, were they full two by tens or were they the partial two by tens we know today? Yeah, they, I think they were more of a full. Okay. Um, you didn't comment on the condition of the steel trusses that were in that space. How, how do they, yeah, they hold the, up? The condition looks good for the truss. Okay. Um, this, the issue of settlement, when do you think that settlement occurred? Likely over the course of the life of the building. I, isn't it common to see settlement occur more often at the beginning or the early after? construction due to, you know, issues that have to do with the soils that were excavated. I mean, the Tower of Pisa is a good example. Yeah, it, it certainly can. It can. Um, there can be things that imp impact the soil over the course of its use. What do you think uh, could have been the cause of that settlement over time? I mean, the building wasn't really impacted by other structures around it. Um, so. Yeah, I haven't explored that question thoroughly, so I, I don't have anything that I've gathered information to respond to. Do you think specific. water could have caused some of that issue if the water off the building was not maintained properly and it began to swell up the, 
the soils may well be clay because the Madison is covered with clay. So is there a chance that, that water from the roofs may have moved the, the water, clay and swelled the up? Water, freeze thaw, yeah. adjacent construction, there's any number of sorts of uh, contributing factors that could cause if, it. If the soils are somewhat prone to that activity, um, would this be uh, a concern for the adjoining buildings during construction or demolition, in fact? It's usually not a concern unless you're close to the adjacent ones. Uh, when you do adjacent construction, you do have to stabilize as necessary, protect the adjacent construction. Yeah. Um, there's a pretty sizable separation between these buildings and the adjacent ones that's pretty workable, though. Are, are you familiar with the, uh, the um, Department of Interior's temporary protection tech notes where they talk about protecting historic structures during um, construction and demolition? I'm aware of the more general requirements yeah. to protect adjacent construction. Yeah, I mean, there are cracks evident in the station across the street um, that are probably natural and normal enough to expect they've been repaired. Um, so the, li the post office also is a significant building in the district and would be another concern. So would, would you suggest certain special techniques be used during demolition and or construction? You would want to follow whatever the recommended uh, measures are within the standards. Okay. Um, the front wall displacement that you noted, um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the brick on the front of the building is actually distinctly different than the side brick. So they may not have woven them together. Can't, you can't tell, but they certainly don't weave together right at the corner where you can see them. Yeah, there's terracotta behind the face brick in any, in any event. Yeah. Uh, the, so, but that's a fairly common condition, is it not, for um, brick masonry facades to begin to lean away from the structure in old buildings? It may be... It may happen in a number of old buildings, but it's a condition you want to address. Yes, I agree completely. Um, I've, I would just like to ask you briefly about the report from John Hatch, the uh, architect. Uh, he says there is some minor water damage on the interior and the building is not in imminent danger of collapse. Its rehabilitation or restoration would be expensive but not impossible. Do you agree with that assessment? Could you, I'm sorry, can you read it again? I, I don't oh, think I read it. I'm sorry. There is some minor water damage on the interior, and the building is not in imminent danger of collapse. Its rehabilitation or restoration would be expensive, but not impossible. I would agree that you could, with uh, enough funds, address the conditions, but it's in significantly bad condition requiring significant structural work, as well as other okay. things that people speak to to address the conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, two, two questions. In historic preservation, adaptive reuse is always favored. Is there an adaptability factor of this building? Is this adaptable in renovating it and changing, doing a different kind of building. How, how would you assess that? So <clears throat> I can only speak to the structural right, component of right. that. Um, it, was, it was designed and built for a very specific use, and the configuration is pretty unique to theaters. So it's difficult to, to adapt a theater building to another use. Um, with the conditions that we have in this particular theater building, it's especially challenging and costly to try to approach that. Okay. The fact that the facade is, appears to be pulling away from the, called the box of the building, does that give any indication that it would be possible to do that intentionally and save the facade as if, if if something happened to the rest of the building, could you save the existing facade and reapply it? The front facade? Mm-hmm. Um, you could... I know this is a quick question and something you didn't really study, but is, is that done and could that maybe work? Structurally, you could work out ways to um, 
stabilize and reattach a facade to a new structure. Um, it's a costly endeavor. And um, I can't speak to how that impacts the design as a whole or the architectural components or historic I'm components. not asking you to. I'm just saying, is it, is it possible in your experience as a structural engineer? With enough, yeah, with enough yes. um, funds, it's possible. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So just following up, um, largely pertaining to the questions my colleague, Mr. Kellogg, has asked you, um, based on my understanding, I want to know, would it be fair to say that this building does not need to be demolished because of structural problems, but rather due to its financial constraints of the desired use? I.e., the building is not falling down. You simply, it does not need to be demolished. You wish to demolish it. If, if it were salvaged, it would need significant st structural restoration as well as other sorts of repairs, but it's feasible apart from the financial and other considerations. Okay. Thank you. The board may want to consider asking Mr. Hatch a question. Mr. McManus will provide testimony shortly after the witness has finished his examination, but the board may wish to ask Mr. Hatch if he has any questions for Mr. Hofstadler while, while he's before the board, the commission. I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> Regarding the roof structure, you would um, you testified that the uh, roof joists were undersized and that they would need to be replaced. Could they actually be sistered? Could you keep them in place and um, and add additional roof joists to improve uh, how they function structurally? So <clears throat> that would be a financial evaluation because to sister them, there's a few challenges. One is the sagged, deflected shape is significant. Ah, okay. Um, the other is there's a number of hangers that are attached supporting the plaster ceiling below. So you'd have to work out what that sistering plan would look like and price it out compared to a replacement plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hello. Any other questions? Dave has a question. The Persimmon um, report is, was entered into um, the, the proceedings. I'm assuming you could comment on the conclusions from that report. Right. I, was that your question? Yeah. I, I, I reviewed it and it was consistent with my findings. I, I agreed generally with what was stated in that. Well, he made a statement of primary concern are the horizontal cracks that propagate through the brick pilasters that hold the, um, uh, the, the, the roof joist, not the joist, the, the, the steel structure, and the severe cracks observed in portions of the terracotta walls which serve to laterally brace the structure against the wind loads. How, do you, how would you uh, remediate that? Was that included in your description? Um, yes. I, the, the horizontal cracks he's referring to are some of the sort that I showed on one of the slides. Right. Um, so I addressed that by indicating that you would, I would really want to investigate that issue further, but likely would have to reinforce it because it's rising from the foundation all the way up to the roof supporting those trusses. And if it's cracking evidence of, say, a bowing outward of the pilaster, that would be a significant structural concern. And the other cracking with the lateral bracing or the, you know, supporting the wind resistance of the building, those cracks that he's referring to are mainly the ones that we showed, that I showed with the first several slides, um, like the one on the screen now, that look like they've occurred as a result of settlement but have damaged the walls that provide lateral resistance. The other thing is he spoke, Mr. Burns spoke about an, uh, requiring an independent steel frame structure on the inside of the existing walls 
to brace the walls and transfer wind and seismic forces will be required. Now, you didn't mention any of that. Is that in the context of retrofitting the building? Um, that's a question I have. I don't know. Um, it's not clear whether he's speaking about uh, use as a theater or use for the different use. So I'd have to review that again to know specifically what he was speaking to. But my comments relate to restoring the, the building in its existing configuration for the types of loads and use that it has now, where I went through a series of work that you'd have to do to, to do that. Um, or if you're going to adapt the use and have to reconfigure things, there's a large portion of the structure that just has to be removed and replaced, either because of condition or because it obstructs or it's okay. not in the right configuration. It's not clear from this report which is which. So you, you believe that that probably has to do with the, re, the different use of the building for the mixed use, for example? I, yeah, I, I, I don't recall specifically what he was okay. commenting on there. Questions from the public? Any questions from the public? This question is for Mr. Hostadler. Correct. Uh, my name is Carol Correa, 41 Man Avenue, East Hanover. Um, I have a question for you, sir. I appreciate your expertise. Could you spell your last name? Last name, C-O-R-E-A, like Chick Correa. Can we get your address to this man? 41 Man Avenue, East Hanover. Thank you. Okay, um, I appreciate your expertise, sir. You've indicated in a lot of what you said here that you have to investigate, we have to look at this, we have to make sure. Are you saying that a lot of this you really don't know if we have a structural problem or if we have the problems that you suspect based on your observation? So we would have to look at them, we don't know yet? still not working. You want to come over here? The majority of the investigation I believe I mentioned related to confirming whether settlement has stopped or not. So that would require investigation to determine what scope of work you'd have to do for the foundations for the soils. However, the issues that I brought up relating to the roof, uh, the cracking in the exterior walls that would have to be addressed, the condition of the walls themselves, uh, the foundations with spalling and de deterioration, um, tying back locations of the wall where there's displacement and separation, all those things I already know they need to be addressed without doing additional investigation. Okay, and in addition to that, you said about the mold, if there was any warped boards, anything, we would have to fully rip things apart to see the extent of that. You wouldn't be able to tell it just by your observations that you've seen. I didn't actually speak to mold. Um, there was a picture up there that you showed with mold and, and with uh, wet boards that you felt would have to be examined oh, the floor further. Boards. Yeah. Well, I was speaking to the structural condition of the wood floor. Okay. All right, and this is, relates to the proposed new structure, what would have to be done to use the existing building to support that, or is it in reference to keeping the existing use of the building? The majority of what I described uh, would be a, a, a fixing of what exists for the, to restore it to a current a use like it's used now. Okay, all right, thank you. Hello, <clears throat> Rob Pratt. 25 Sherwood Avenue, Madison. I was excited to hear you note that the plaster ceiling is actually still intact. Do you know how much of that ornamental ceiling is still up there from the original? Well, it's, co it's covered by an acoustical drop ceiling, right. so you can't so, see the majority of it. So I don't, I don't, I don't know its condition. There. Okay. That's all. I was actually excited to hear that. Deborah Fennelly, 88 Constitution Way, Convent Station, New Jersey. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm particularly interested in a couple of the statements you made, which were not actually the, the core focus, but you talked about um, the unique theater structure of this building. 
And I just wanted to make sure I understood you talked about sloping roofs and sloping floors being unique to a theater construction. Is that correct? Am I, am I understanding what you said? Uh, the sloping floor. The fl for uh, I was referring to theaters having sloping floors. Right. I was wondering if you've had a chance to take a look at the proposed quote unquote theater that the developer is proposing in the new building and whether or not it complies with this unique theater structure or whether it doesn't. Well, well first off, just to clarify, when I said unique structure, I didn't mean that it was unique among theaters. I meant that theaters have sloping floors. Theaters meaning somewhere where you would show movies? Yes. Okay. So have you had a chance to look at the proposed theater that would be a part of the developer's new structure? I, I looked at the overall design of the building, especially as to how it's configured and the levels and what's within it and so forth. So I know there's a theater in it, but I Does haven't... Does that theater, quote-unquote, have the unique characteristics of a, a building or, excuse me, a room built to be a theater? So I think my comments have to li limit to structural issues. Um, your question, Does it have I think, a sloping floor like a theater that would show movies would have. I, I, I don't know. That could be easily okay. answered. All right. No, the Thank architect you. shaking his hand. Thank it does, doesn't. Ron Killian, 142 Southern Boulevard in Chatham. <clears throat> Sir, did you see a seller's disclosure before you inspected the building? Did I see what? Uh, did you see a seller's disclosure before you inspected the building? A seller's disclosure? Yes. No. Uh, a seller's disclosure uh, shows what is wrong with the building. Okay. Uh, so, due to the fact that a large percentage of buildings in Madison, including my own home, has cracks in the foundation, so I was going to ask you. You have to be sworn because you're asking the question based on what you okay. do with your facts. Okay. All right. You swear to the testimony you give in this commission hearing will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Uh, due to the fact that a large percentage of buildings in Madison and the surrounding areas, <clears throat> including my own home, have cracks in the foundation for years. I was going to ask you what your comments after you saw the seller's disclosure, but since you didn't see it, you have no comment on it. Uh, final question is that uh, who hired you to inspect the building? Uh, I was hired through Saxon's attorney. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Eric Dorf Schneider, 9 South Street, Madison. Um, my question has to do with the uh, how quickly the building might be deteriorating due to the breathability of the building. The building hasn't been heated, nor has it been cooled since the ownership, has, since the new ownership. Plus all doors, everything is vacuum sealed. So is, does that equate to a quicker deterioration of the facilities? I'd just like to note that there's a lot of suppositions in there and factual assertions. Uh, I don't know whether this gentleman has specific knowledge of any of that, but uh, mm. with that, I, I, I guess I, I hit something. It's okay. We've you got your question. Let's see if we can answer. So the, the question is, will deterioration continue well, during, well, it's an it, has it's, My question is, ha, has it sped up because of it being sealed, not cooled, not heated, and just something being sealed, you know, with all of everything coming to it, all the weather as it is, you know, not being taken care of. Uh, therefore, if there are leaves on the roof, have they been swept away? Things are happening to the, the facility for it to, I believe, as in a home. I should stop there. But I, okay. to deteriorate quicker than if, it were being used in a weekly, daily basis. Okay, okay, so the large scope of repair work that I identified wouldn't be affected by that. Some things would, perhaps like the uh, condition of the floorboards in the second floor, for instance. Okay. Um, that could be impacted. Right. But the exterior wall conditions, the settlement question. The settlement, um, yes the pulling away of the walls from separations, uh, the structural deficiency in the roof, none of that is impacted. No? No. Okay. I know that if I have leaves in my gutter, I remove them yearly yeah. before something happens. Okay. Thank you. 
Stan Nicola Gaskey, 136 Park Avenue. Um, thank you very much for your report. Um, it seemed very thorough and well organized, and I really appreciated this part um, that you did, this structural work required to continue using the building. I wanted to follow up on a question that Chris asked, um, because I, if, you, if you, sometimes there's engineers that specialize in historic structures, and they come to some different conclusions because of their experience with analyzing loads for when you have full two by sixes or whatever it was. Um, is there, you said that the roof may not be the right, have the right load capacity. Is there a chance that the calculation with the other joists makes a difference or no? Um, so the, the difference in the size of the joist between a nominal size of today mm -hmm. versus a, a full, in this case, 10 inches, um, is a depth of about a half inch, maybe five eighths inch difference. And it does make some difference in the low carrying capacity. Um, but when we evaluated it, we considered the measured sizes that we had. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you've also kind of talked about that these repairs would be very extensive. Um, but you haven't, I mean, is there a percentage of the brick that you feel needs to be replaced? Were you able to quantify it at all? Of the exterior brick? Yeah, yeah. So to address the significant cracking that relates to the settlement, um, that was observed primarily on the east elevation, and that may impact a quarter or so of that elevation. Um, some of what I didn't speak to as much as some of my colleagues might speak to is the, just the condition of the exterior brick itself, not so much from a structure, structural standpoint, but with regard to acting as a, a barrier to the weather. Um, and if there's an aesthetic component that needs to be restored, you, you can't, without doing more investigation, determine with too much precision how much of that brick needs to be replaced because of the it's covered by the coating. However, the coating's in very bad shape in locations where the conditions are showing through, it's, it's indicative that there's a large percentage of the brick that would have to be removed and replaced. I don't know what that percentage is. You don't know what per that percentage no. is. Um, and does it need to have a new, um, some kind of stucco finish on it again, or would that just be an aesthetic? Or, would, or are you saying that may be just a cheaper way without replacing as much brick because of some of the damage brick. Right, there's ways you can economize to not have to replace as much brick. Okay. Um, and, and, and thinking about the financials of it, you've kind of talked quite a bit about um, whether it's financially feasible. Um, were, do you have any idea how much it would cost to make the structural repairs you've prescribed in Section 4.0? No, we haven't been engaged to try to figure that out yet. Um, wouldn't that be something that would be helpful to actually uh, historical well, commission to understand? Well, the scope is significant and there's a, lar a large quantity of work that would be required. So it's, it's evident that, especially to move forward with the adaptive use of this building, it really isn't financially, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a financially viable approach. Um, okay. Okay, but for preserving the building. For preserving the building, I, I haven't been engaged to do that. Okay, so it just wasn't the scope of your work for them. That right. is something that you could do, though. You would have to do more investigation of, to identify quantities and figure out costs. Um, could you do a rough order of magnitude budget on something like this? Is that something that's commonly done, just to get a sense of the feasibility of restoring it? I couldn't today, standing here now. Um, you'd have to qualify. Yeah. yeah, just interject to say sure. the Preservation Commission, in fact, the Planning Board, nobody in New Jersey under the Municipal Land Use Law can talk about specific money. Um, that's not something that would, that is a relevant point for our discussion. Okay. So 
he's correct in providing a structural engineering report, but not numbers on anything. Just to follow up on the comment of the chair, uh, specific numbers and cost figures are not appropriate, but considerations of the economic feasibility must be and should be discussed in this presentation because it's a factor in the commission's requirements to consider whether a demolition should be approved and or approved with conditions. So specific numbers cannot be referred to, but economic feasibility is a proper concern. You may ask him, he may have covered that in his testimony. I don't want to suggest he did or didn't. Right, I don't understand, um, Mr. Laughlin. How do you uh, how do you have economic feasibility without knowing the numbers? Economic feasibility is a term that applies to, and I don't want to simplify it too much, but reasonable and appropriate. You know the expression "money has no object." Uh, anything is possible with certain expenditures being made. Because of guidelines that we've received from judicial decisions and in the formation of the ordinance, which was crafted in light of those decisions, it's referred to as economic utility and feasibility. As to whether something is reasonable and appropriate, considering the factors that have to be dealt with in accordance with this gentleman's testimony about what is wrong with the building, to use my terms, and is it reasonable and appropriate to expect that it can be continued? I don't want to go beyond that because I, I don't want to testify or offer my opinion. I just, I just want to say specific dollar is not allowed. Economic utility and feasibility is. Is a range of numbers, though? No. No, no numbers. Stop. No. no numbers. Okay. Thank you. So, so how would you, you know You can't engage me, please. I'm sorry. Questions. So my question is, how do you determine economic feasibility? And let or me just why say, why do you enter it into the discussion if there's no numbers? That's what I don't understand. I'm sorry. I'll let I'll let our witness talk about that. I just want to remind everybody we, we're pushing a clock okay. here. If you can keep your questions clear and to three minutes, I don't want to have hundreds of people telling me they didn't get a chance to speak. Yeah, I understand. Um, so, thank you, Sandy. Is there an open question for Well, me? the question is, how do you determine economic feasibility without having a rough order of magnitude of what it would cost to fix something? <clears throat> so to, to adapt the use, I know that it would be uh, less, there's too much scope and there's not enough of the structure that you're salvaging for that use for it to make sense. Okay. So you're only saying it's not economic, the, the economic feasibility for adapting the use to adding stories on top of what's there is not economically feasible, but you're not making a comment as to whether restoring the theater is economically feasible. Well, I, I think I, I, I have less information about the economic evaluation with respect to saving the theater. Um, it, it would be a there's a big business component of that decision. I, I'm just telling my clients that there's significant and a large scope of repair work that would be required that would cost a lot of money uh, to restore it for its existing use. Um, but I haven't quantified that. But you haven't quantified it. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Sebastian Esposito, 81 Woodland Road. I think you know how to spell the last name. Yes, what was the address though? 81 Woodland Road, Madison. Uh, a question, is the building condemned? Was it I, condemned when it was sold? You're asking me? I, 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 I don't know. Can I uh, present that question to the no. panel? No? OK. All right. Um, did you inspect the building when it was sold? I inspected it in January. Okay. Do you know if the building is deteriorated? Or, or sorry, Feb February. Do you know if the building is deteriorated from the time of its sale until now? Uh, recapping a similar question earlier, the majority of the scope that I commented on isn't impacted by uh, the additional exposures that it's ex experienced over the in recent months or the past year or so. So does that mean it's not affected by? 
In your opinion, then, does that mean that elements don't affect the condition of the exterior or the roof of the building? Oh, for exterior? Well, okay. Are you saying it hasn't deteriorated because the elements don't impact the f structure of the building? So you're, you're asking about the exterior and the exterior elements? Well, just as the building deteriorated means the whole building, right? Interior and exterior. You're saying it hasn't, okay. it hasn't right? So. Um, Except maybe some floorboards. The exterior of the building would continue to deteriorate at a, a fairly similar rate that it has been for a number of years. So is it reasonable to assume that some basic upkeep is required for any building? Yeah, maintenance is required for buildings. And was maintenance performed that you could see? Um, I, I, I don't know specifically what maintenance has been performed, but it doesn't, it's a building in poor shape that doesn't look like it's been. No, I, I understand, but if you had a building in poor shape and there were leaks, it would make sense to try to stop or remediate those while it was standing fallow, no? So it wouldn't deteriorate? If, if you need to continue using it and continue to... No, no, I mean, if you just need to keep the building in its current state so that it doesn't degrade, obviously you don't want an unsafe building, right? Yeah, there is some contribution of the ongoing time, uh, but it's a very small contribution to the scope of what I've observed. So is it, the obli is it commercially zoned, do you know? I don't know. So is there an obligation to maintain it? Excuse me, I, I respectfully, I think he's going beyond the scope in terms of zoning and, and code provisions. He's a structural engineer. I think that th there are things that Chairman, need to be maintained. Speaking, sure. It's an question. Okay. Okay. Okay, just can, uh, uh, last question. Can you please describe again the economic feasibility that you're sp um, specifically uh, speaking to in the assessment of the building's condition as to whether or not it should be, uh, um, it can be repaired or it should not be repaired? Again, that's been asked and answered. I respect No, I, I'm just on. trying to focus it to make sure I understand economic feasibility for the structure as it is today or for the proposed structure? I'm confused. Um, yeah, summarizing what I stated earlier, it's primarily, um, or I should say it this way, the conditions that are required to adapt the use as well as the reconfiguring is clear to me that it's not an economical, it's not economically uh, feasible, viable to do that. Um, to repair the structure for its existing use, there's a significant amount of scope of work that would be required. I don't have that quantified. Um, I just it could be done. Please let him finish. So, sorry. I yeah, tech, technically, from an engineering standpoint, it could be could be fixed with enough funds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. McManus, do you have any specific questions? As you provided the HPC with the structural engineering report, do you have questions that you would like to ask of Mr. Hostetter? Um. Well, did you, is this on? Okay. Um, did you address uh, foundation repairs and any kind of uh, perhaps like studies or anything you'd have to do on that in order to save the building or bring it up to any sort of um, uh, structural integrity as far as the existing foundation? Because I figure we start from the foundation. Go up. Are you referring to where there's settlement? Can What's that? Are you referring to where there's concerns of settlement? You know, the entire building. There's, there's footings and foundations and foundation walls. Right. Well, my focus has been on where I saw evidence of settlement. Um, so that would, that would need to be studied and right. um, stabilized if the settlement is ongoing. Um, 
Are you asking about? No, we, we did um, a little bit of a study also, and we don't really take too much exception to. Go ahead. <laughs> because it would be more appropriate since Mr. McManus has done a report yeah. for him to make, a, I'll ask him certain questions about that report and what he did in connection with right. the reports that are supplied to the commission for this proceeding, in particular the testimony of Mr. Hostetler, if right, that's acceptable right. to the commission. Yeah, I, I don't... Before, I, you have to be sworn. Sir, you can sit down or if you're comfortable, if you'd rather stand. I think you're finished for the moment. Thank you. Mr. McManus, would you state your full name and address sure. for the record? Sure. John McManus, M-C-M-A-N-U-S. Um, business have, address? Business address is 13 Madison Avenue in Madison, New Jersey. Okay. Do you swear that the testimony you give in this hearing and any reports or evidence you supply will be the truth and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McManus, I'm going to ask that you stay where you are because I think these conditions are a little bit difficult. It probably take you five minutes to get over here. Okay. But <laughs> we're going to have your testimony from where you sit. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Mr. McManus, what is your business, please, sir? Business is uh, McManus Design Group Incorporated, Structural Engineers. Our office is at 13 Madison Avenue, and uh, we've been uh, in business since... Uh, 1992 and I am the president of the company and I have uh, a couple of other associates professional engineers and also um, we prepared this report before we get to your report I have to qualify you by mm -hmm. putting forth your experience and training and education yeah. because you're going to provide and testimony as a consultant or expert sure. to the Commission in this hearing okay sir yep would you explain to the board and the public your training and experience in the field, your educational background, and then your training and experience in the field of engineering. Sure. Um, graduated from New Jersey Institute of Technology in 1992, uh, in 1993, excuse me, and um, been working in structural engineering since that time in this company that I own now. Uh, been about 25, 26 years, and primarily working in a rehabilitation of structures including parking garages and buildings uh were you i think you were seated i'm not sure when we started the hearing you had prepared a report for the commission in this case is that correct yes you were retained by the commission to analyze the structural condition of the property that's being considered before the commission this evening is that correct yes 14 lincoln and sir were you retained by the commission to perform, and I'm going to use the words in the ordinance, a report and analysis and opinion about the structural soundness and the integrity of this building. Is that Correct. a fair statement? Correct. I'm going to ask you in your own words to explain what you did in your study or analysis, part one, of the information that's before the commission this evening regarding this property and its structural condition, and then part two, your opinion or a statement to the board about what you believe to be the case for this property as far as its structural condition, soundness, and integrity. Is that acceptable? Sure. Okay. You've uh, also had access to the reports of the applicants, consultants, Mr. Hostetler, and the uh, 2018 report that was done uh, earlier, and then, of course, the uh, architectural report submitted by the applicant and Mr. Hatch's report. There have been five marked into evidence. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Can you tell the commission and the public here tonight what you did to analyze that question or that subject? Okay. Um, and my associate, John Deng, who is a professional engineer, and myself um, did a full walkthrough of the building um, from the foundation all the way into the roof structure. And uh, basically, our entire um, Analysis was visual only. We, we did not do any destructive testing or anything like that. We did mostly uh, um, just uh, mostly uh, vi visual inspections, and so uh, much much of the um, structure is uh, obviously there's walls and that are still together. We didn't break any walls. We didn't do any remove any ceilings or anything like that. There's a lot of ceilings that are still covered up by 
different finishes and things like that. But we did um, observe uh, some foundation issues and some um, framing. A, a portion of the framing we can see, a lot of the framing was covered up. Um, and so, and also the roof structure we can also see. Um, so as far as the condition goes, um, this building obviously um, has really been neglected for probably a couple of decades. So there was a lot of water damage. There's a lot of maintenance that has not been done on the building. Uh, roof structure, there's um, much of the, uh, the joists and the sheathing and all that on the roof structure itself has gotten much, a lot of water damage and a lot of cracking. The um, roof structure is supported by um, truss, steel trusses. The tr steel trusses seem to be in pretty good condition, although we ran some preliminary calculations on that and they seem to be uh, pretty under-designed by today's code and today's standards. Um, the, um, so the, the trusses are supporting, are also holding up the ceiling below. There's a lot of damage on the ceiling below. Um, there's some, there's some uh, what do you call it, um, acoustical ceiling in, in the theater area that's um, covering up the ceiling above that, so you couldn't really see a lot of that. Um, the walls themselves, I think the other engineers all mentioned the same thing we mentioned, and that is that there's a lot of cracking, there's a lot of diagonal cracking, sheer cracking on the Outside, you can see a lot of cracking. Also on the inside, there's a lot of cracking. Um, and also, the original structure is uh, masonry. Or the original wall structure is masonry. It's wall bearing. And it's um, got the backing, backup of uh, terracotta, which is in pretty poor shape. And it's also not a, a very good structural uh, element to use and by today's standards especially. Um, uh, you can see it in a lot of areas on the inside uh, that the walls are pulling away from the slabs and the slabs are structural um, reinforced concrete slabs uh, on the second floor or on the uh, first floor for the um, front part of the building. Um, the steel below that is in pretty good shape. Um, in the basement area. There's only a portion of the basement, which is the front, front section of the building. Um, that's in, in satisfactory condition. Um, so there's a second floor, a mezzanine level on the second in the front portion of the building, which is, uh, looks like wood framing, which is in pretty rough shape. The floors are um, in pretty bad shape and they've been, have a lot of water damage as well. Um, let's see. You can refer to your report if you'd like. This is not meant to be a, a memory challenge. Um, no, it's okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I, the, uh, one of the things that I was concerned about is the, uh, the foundation itself. Because it's really, there's no way to see the foundation of what's there. Um, so a, a, a study and a probably a destructive test would have to be done to see exactly what the structure is. If It, it really would depend on what the use would be. If you're going to add another level or something like that, you'd have to, um, you'd have to uh, you know, do some sort of study, geotechnical study or something to see what the uh, structure can hold as far as the foundation goes. Um, uh, also, I think the the intended use, I believe, is they're going to have parking underneath, which would mean they would have to excavate that. So, if they were going to excavate that, you'd be underpinning foundations and things like that. So, um, and I mean, generally, that's the condition of the building. Um, it's been neglected. I think everybody who's seen it would agree with that. Um, and uh, there's mechanical issues, and there's electrical issues, which I'm not, I don't get into as a structural, but I, I can certainly see them when I was there. Um, 
and uh, and I did offer in the report, you know, various um, anecdotes as far as how, what you can do to repair certain things, um, like the. Uh, in the front of the building, you can see in the front facade, you can see that some of the brick is, is bowing out above the windows and things like that. I mean, you could pin those. You could add steel back up to it. You can add a steel structure to the inside of it. All these would be costly, of course. Um, uh, but you could repair certain things. The lintels and over all the windows are pretty much um, deteriorated. Uh, they would ha all have to get repaired, or re they would have to get replaced. Um, Are there code requirements that would also come into play in addition to the conditions you observe? Code requirements for the for well, that would require additional work for this building, either to continue it well, as it presently exists, or to uh, adapt it for a possible further use. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not. 100% sure on the rehab code, but but I believe if you if you're doing it that extent of work, you'd have to bring it into compliance. I'd like uh, if you could, John. The ordinance talks about uh, structural soundness and building integrity. Is there any difference in those two terms? And if so, what is the difference? Structural soundness and what? Building integrity. Building integri integrity. Is, is there, there any difference in those terms? No, not really. It's, it's Pretty synonymous. If you had to summarize the overall condition of this building, what would you describe it as? If I had to summarize the condition? Um, as far as its structural condition. Structural, I would say it's in pretty poor shape. Um, and it's not in imminent danger of collapse or anything like that, but it would, it would require quite a bit of work to bring it up to acceptability. Thank you, John. Uh, chairs, I'd suggest that Mr. Wilson be given an opportunity to question John before the commission would have questions for him. I appreciate the opportunity. We'd like to try to get to additional witnesses, so we'll pass. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Any questions from anyone on uh, the commission? I just have one question for you, John. In the words of the song, tell me something good. I, this, Tell you something this, is, good? this is a historic building in our historic district. What's good well, about it? I think council pointed out before anything could be fixed. It just depends on how much money it would cost. <laughs> so, um, I and my report I did mention I think almost in each section of mm -hmm. certain repairs that could be considered. Um, a cost analysis would have to be done. Plans would have to be developed in order to get a cost for that kind of thing, but, but, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other commission members have comments? Do you have specific experience with historic buildings? Do I? Or, or masonry brick older buildings? Yeah, we have some, yeah. Would you anticipate that um, the repairs you mentioned that might happen to this structure would be done in a phased format? You might do a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, kind of slowly stabilize, move up, foundation upwards. You mean like on the outside, the, the... Well, I guess inside or outside, but just to stabilize the building, I'm wondering if a phased approach would be reasonable. Like phasing the work, you mean? Yes, or? correct. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, uh, that's kind of like a means and methods kind of question. It would really... I, I imagine if somebody were going to go and repair it, they would probably try and repair the whole, the whole envelope of the building at once. Yeah. So that would be the more economic, feasible yep. way to do it. Okay. Well, anybody else? Yeah. In your conclusions, uh, you say that virtually all structural components that make up the structure in its current condition would require extensive rebuilding, reinforcement, or replace and or replacement and issues with the exterior bearing walls would have to be addressed by introducing a remedial structure system and I, th I think you just described it such as steel columns and beams to replace or supplement some that sounds like a lot to me am, am I overreacting to what you said well it is a lot it virtually every 
component of the building is either under designed or damaged enough where it would require extensive work or or replacement and this is true whether it was for current use or the proposed mixed uh, unit use. yes yeah. I guess I'd like to ask council's questions a sort of the same way would you say the structural integrity integrity of the building has been somewhat moderately or seriously compromised from a sta safety standpoint from um, I would say moderate at this point but uh, without having x-ray vision or being able to see every component it's impossible to say really but. Okay. okay I'm going to suggest for the sake of all our health that we take a five minute five minute break um, and then when we reconvene we will have opportunity for the public to ask any specific questions of Mr. McManus and move on to our architectural presentation thank you there there are restrooms downstairs if you go in the lobby and take the stairs down you'll find your way to public restrooms 1750, I think, 1760. Something. Oh, rested and ready? Okay. We were about to the part of the meeting where um, John McManus, the engineer for the borough, has presented his report. Are there any, I think the commission is finished with their questions, yes? And so we open that to the public to ask questions of Mr. McManus's report on the structural condition of the building. Are there any public questions? And, and in the interest of time, remember stating your name, your address, ask your question, and please sit down. Let's not have these endless question after question after question because we do feel the need to hear from everybody. Thank you. Eric Range, Bellow Avenue, Madison. Um, I just want to clarify something that you said. You stated that the building was likely neglected for years or even decades. So the structural disrepair and danger to preserving the structure occurred long before the current owners. Is that correct? It's a, somewhat of a, an assumption. I don't know exact dates, but I don't, uh, the original owner you're talking about, or I mean, the previous owner, or, or yeah. the owner before that, yeah, or the I owner before say, that. I don't even know how long the last owner was in it. Yeah. But, but, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. James Gilbert, 30 Oak Hill Road, Chatham Touch. I have a very simple question for both the structural engineers. Um, has the building inspector missed something here? Should these, this can, building be condemned? I, can you, sorry, can you say it into the microphone? Should the building be condemned? Uh, that's not really my that's a code question. function. Okay. So, right. That's not really my function, just, um, just doing a condition report basically on the, the building. But we did touch on the uh, question, I think, earlier was good, better, or best. I think it's a, somewhere in the middle, right? Okay. And could I ask that of the, the other structural engineer here? Oh, okay. Thank you. I just have one quick question. Just to follow up on the first gentleman's question. The the, the conditions that you have described in your report, and then again today in your testimony, uh, is your opinion consistent with that of Wayne's that a number of those conditions, in fact, most of those conditions, date back well beyond, much further back in time than the ownership for the last two years of the current owner? Oh, yeah. I would say so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, One more question, yes, question. <clears throat> um, yes, Mr. McManus, so what are your credentials again, please? 
because um, it, it appears that you're not the engineer. Is that correct in your firm? I, Are you the me? engineer of your firm, or do you have an engineering degree? I am a design engineer, structural design engineer, and I have an associate, John Deng, who is also an engineer. He's the professional engineer. He's the professional engineer, and he's not here tonight. Is he's that not right? here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the questions from the public for Mr. McManus, and we move on. Thank you, John. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to call Jeff Gertler, our project engineer. Architect. Architect. Oh, my God. What time? All these years of being called engineer. Raise your hand, please. Yes. Yes. Jeffrey J. Gertler, 145 West 30th Street, New York, New York, 1001. Okay, I'm going to seek to qualify you as an expert in the area of architecture. Okay. okay can you give us a, a brief description of your educational, professional experience and qualifications? Yes. Uh, my education, I have um, a civil engineering and economics degree from Rutgers University, and then I have an architecture degree afterwards from City College. I began my practice in 1985 as the um, um, founding partner. We're now a firm of about 25 architects and professionals in New York. And do you hold profession professional licensures? Uh, I do in New York, in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, in Massachusetts, uh, Texas, Nevada. Okay, and you've been engaged as the project architect to design the proposed building at 14 Lincoln Place? Yes, I have. And I see a model there. Did you uh, prepare that? Well, I can't myself do it, but a 3D printer and some young people in my office did it, yes. Okay, so just for the record, maybe we can mark that uh, A5. A5 model. Right? We're not leaving that, though. Pardon? We're not leaving that, though. Did you think we are going to leave that? Well, <laughs> sideboard. Discussion. I don't know what the commission's policy <laughs> well, no, well, is well, on we, retention we of exhibits. As long as we can get it back, we'll happy to leave it. You'll be able to get like it to. back at some point. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. And then... Uh, also, you've uh, prepared portions of the PowerPoint that you're going to refer to? Yes. Okay. And we've already indicated that that's going to be A4. So can you please guide uh, the Commission and the public through your design, paying particular attention to the Madison design guidelines that you integrated into the design of the project? I will. Thank you. Well, thank you for um, your time. It's nice to see you again this evening. Um, I, I thought maybe the first thing that I do is that because so much time has elapsed from the first time that we first introduced this project was to take a step back and understand how we got to this design today. And, and I would start by, uh, I think Chris knows this probably as good as anyone else in this uh, auditorium tonight. You know, when you design the building, you don't just start by putting a pencil to paper, but you have to begin to understand um, some underlying issues that go into the basic concept of the building. So how did this start with this building? One is that this site is in, as we know, downtown Madison, a commercial district as well as a uh, historic preservation area as well. Um, but the important thing is that in downtown commercial district of Madison, um, it's been years that we know that um, all of our merchants, they struggle competing against uh, the large shopping malls, which maybe lately have not been doing that well. Uh, certainly the uh, online um, uh, purchasers uh, are debilitating many of the uh, merchants. Um, and then lastly, and lastly, we're competing, of course, against um, Florham Park and Chatham and Morristown and Summit. So they, they have um, a tough go of it. Um, uh, also, uh, on, on a residential side, um, since I've been in Madison for over 20 years, the conversation from day one has been, is Madison too expensive for our young people to move into Madison? Uh, is it too expensive for older people who are empty nesters uh, to even live here any longer? So those are the underlying issues as to why this building is a mixed-use building. It has a retail component that's on the first floor, and the retail component has really three commercial spaces in it. The first two commercial spaces are at the front of the building that face Kings Road. Uh, one is about 2,200 square feet. The second is about 2,300 square feet. And there's a commercial space in the back that, that we'd like to see as a 
proposed movie theater that's about 2,200 square feet for the theater component and about 700 square feet for the ticket sales, concessions, bathrooms, etc. Above that, there are three floors of residential, 24 units of which there are one, two, and three bedrooms, a mixture of them. Four of them we know are COE units, which are sorely needed in Madison. Um, but besides, besides those underlying issues, there's also another issue that's because of its location, is that it needs to conform to the downtown historic guidelines, it needs to conform to the uh, ordinances, and it needs to conform to our master plan. So um, while those are somewhat prescriptive on occasion, I think we look past that on some level to say, after we achieve those prescriptive issues, is there something more important about this building? And what's more important is that we want it to be reflective of and honor the history of Madison. But not only that, we also want it to be reflective of and honor the future of Madison. So this bling doesn't just sit in the past, but it looks to the future as well. Uh, having said that, maybe we can then take a look at more of the specific items about the building itself. So uh, the design guidelines, I'm going to have to get my glasses on from here, I'm sorry. So this is directly from our design guidelines. It's important that I read a couple of these things because this gives us the foundation from which we designed the building from. Stylistic differences among buildings downtown are worth preserving. There is no one style to which all the buildings in the downtown ever did or ever should conform. The buildings complement each other by their common scale and materials. Good craftsmanship and a clear relationship to the street are just as important as details like brackets or transoms. Additionally, it says, all buildings shall be recognized as products of their own time. There is no need to falsely create an earlier historic appearance or introduce historicizing alterations which have no historical basis. Um, so, you know, within the guidelines, there are multiple sort of bullet points that need to be addressed in designing a building. So we'll go through the bullet points to make sure that we've covered them, because that's what we are mandated to do in the design of this building. Uh, the first item is siting. Uh, the setback and orientation of a new building within the historic district should align with neighboring historic buildings. In Madison's civic commercial historic district, siting is different in the civic and commercial areas. The commercial buildings are located right on the sidewalk with a facade the full width of the historic district. South of the railroad, institutional buildings are set within large lots with, a general, with a generous setbacks. So just very quickly, so here's an uh, image of Lincoln Place, and this is the existing, of course, movie theater building as is. Our building sits on the same footprint, except we've actually moved it five feet. Uh, after we would remove the building, we would move it five feet to the west. But it's virtually on the sidewalk in the same location that the ordinance has, or guidelines have asked us to place the building. Excuse me. <clears throat> Size and scale. New construction should conform to the massing, proportions, volume, scale, and height of neighboring buildings. So <clears throat> there are two buildings on Lincoln Place that provide uh, the most direction as to how this building should be designed. There are some one-story buildings on the block, but as we know, the current uh, building and or zoning ordinances don't even allow one-story buildings any longer. So we're not trying to make our building conform to one-story buildings, which can't be built anymore anyways in downtown, except through variants, as we know. Um, so if you look at, at our building alongside the train station, which is directly across the street from it, you can see that the train station has its roof eave. This is where, at this point, which is at, um, God, hard to read this, I'm sorry. Great, thank you. So the, let me stand here. So the edge between the roof and the front wall of the train station building is at 37 feet. 
Our building, which goes up to three stories and then sets back, is a, is a half a foot lower than that. So it addresses that point to this point. The train station building goes up to 49 feet. Our building goes up to the top of the parapet to 46 feet, actually less than that. And in a more descriptive way of seeing that is um, seeing it directly this way and just to make sure you're understanding the eve of the, or the end of that roof line to our parapet and the top of the building to the top of our parapet. So we are actually lower in both instances. So we're addressing our neighbor directly across the street. Um, the only other tall building on the block is a three-story building, uh, six Lincoln Place. Um, the height of the top of the parapet is 34 feet, so we're only to the top of our parapet that's on the, uh, the face of the building on the street, again, is at 36.5 feet, so we're only two and a half feet higher. So of the two buildings on the block that are the most similar to a new building, which is our new building, and not to the one-story buildings, which are not even legal going forward, or a civic building that's recessed back, we are in total conformance or um, uh, reflecting what is on the block already. Uh, rhythm and directional emphasis. So this is speaking vertically at this point. New construction should be compatible with the rhythm of neighboring buildings along the street. Rhythm is defined by the relationship of buildings to open space along the street, the relationship of solids to voids on building facades, and the relationship of entrances to the street. So directional emphasis, whether vertical or horizontal, in character of new construction should relate to that of neighboring buildings. So what we did is we took a look at buildings in downtown Madison and tried to understand how they were formulated. What was the basis of their design? So here's 55 Main Street. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. But we have, we, what we found is that the majority of these buildings uh, develop a rhythm, and the rhythm is often an A-B-A -A rhythm. There's a certain set of window patterns in the center of a building, and they're different on the left side and different on the right side. Often the columns or pilasters are, uh, create that separation between the A-B-A -A rhythms. Um, we see this at 50 Main Street, another contributing building. This one, it's really almost AAA. -A -A. The only difference about this in the center is that there's a pediment on top with a, a plaque at the pediment. But again, it's almost like an ABA -A rhythm. Uh, British Home Emporium, outside the district, but there's a reason why we're showing it, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Again, it has an A, B, and an A rhythm. Um, I'll speed this up. Six Lincoln Place. So now we're on the block that we're on, of course, on Lincoln Place. Again, an A, a B, and A. In this case, the center is really subordinate to the uh, shoulders on the left and the right sides. Um, our building um, is also an A and a B rhythm, separated by large uh, columns between the, uh, the three different portions of the building. Um, and just to put it into context, this is a fairly good example of all the buildings in downtown Madison. We've added a couple more because um, the James Building is an interesting building. It's not ABA, it's a little bit scattered, but, it, but you can see the rhythms of that, how it sets up. Even at Seven Waverly, which we, it has that same ABA rhythm with this large circular pediment on the top. But that, that rhythm of ABA seems to be very consistent throughout downtown Madison. Um, I won't read this again, it's the same thing, but now we're talking about it horizontally, how that works with buildings. Um, without going through each building the way I did before, in this one image you can see all of these buildings basically have a separation of, of sort of the headpiece, the shaft, and the base itself. And what happens in these buildings is that there's often a distinguishing line separating this sometimes with these mansard roofs or sometimes with um, gables or uh, sticking out from the buildings uh, and then there's usually about two stories or three stories that would be the shaft that's different than the upper um, sort of the upper portion of the building and then the lowest portion of the building which is usually the retail portion itself is usually distinguished by very large windows uh, in these buildings. Now, this is not the example I'll show for large windows, but you can see the below this point, they separate often with either material changes or just with large expanses of glass. 
uh, but there's a separation between almost the, the three different uh, portions of the building. Uh, storefronts, traditional storefronts in the Madison Civic Commercial Historic District were composed of a single story shop front, two or three upper stories, and a decorative top cornice or parapet. Storefront design should relate to the composition, material style, and detailing of the upper floors. Historically, commercial buildings had large windows to pass light into the rear of display windows was particularly common on traditional storefronts and was often covered in 20th century renovations. So <clears throat> in this example, you see uh, several buildings indicative of downtown Madison. We're familiar with the James Building. And what we see that's very common to these buildings is that, bit oh, go back. <laughs> okay, all right, back to home. Uh, no, wrong one. Go back. Okay, that's it. Um, that we see in, let's say, the James Building, is that between the structural columns, they put as much glass as they can. This is done in most buildings because the reality is that any retailer wants to have as much glass as they can. They want to show off their product. They want to bring light into the building uh, for any number of reasons. And in fact, over the years, as our technology improved and we were able to span longer distances, you know, originally it was just with wood, and then it became, uh, it could have been concrete and steel, but as the, as the distance between columns got larger, the glass companies had to begin to make larger pieces of glass to accommodate the need for large retail stores. What we did was we took the same initiative, basically having between columns. Um, we have our glass between the columns, um, and then... Um, and then actually, what's interesting about the James Building, as we noticed before, was that you could almost sort of see the same rhythm of column to column and then a midpoint in between. Not something we actually did intentionally, it just turned out to be a great similarity there. Um, next slide. What was also common in a lot of buildings was these transom windows above the large storefront windows. So they would take the larger windows, divide them into smaller pieces. It gave a little bit of a more human scale to that. Um, as it was a decorative element. Sometimes they would put windows in there for circulation. So for any number of reasons, we chose to do the same thing with our windows. We thought it was a good way to break the lower portion of the building to the upper portions by having a few elements in between. <clears throat> um, this, I don't know how many people have seen this slide, but it's a, it's a fantastic slide of the old um, uh, movie building. What, what is very revealing is that there are several things that are very revealing about this slide. One is that um, it also had very large storefront glass for two retail spaces at the front of the building. So it was not an entirely a movie building by any means. It was actually the front of the building up to probably where this gabled roof began, this was, this was all retail space in the front, and there was one, basically the same entrance, the slender entrance in the center, separating the two retail stores. This is Fred Miller's real estate company. I don't know if anybody knows Fred Miller these days. Uh, and the other is a taxi stand. Um, and uh, you can see the marquee, the old marquee is in place. Um, no longer looks like this anymore because now, of course, um, you know, what they did then was they put all the little movie posters and pictures, they actually put them onto the columns. So they weren't on the marquee itself. This was only the advertisement for the Lions Madison. And then this marquee also has these long steel tie rods holding up the canopy because it's a very uh, heavy element and a, and a long cantilevered span that it would require some ties. Um, it looked like Lon Chaney was having a movie there that night too, which is interesting. <laughs> Um, and of course, you see this is a pretty. This building was built in 1925. See the Model T uh, Fords there. Um, but I, I think it's also because we talked about the brick on the front versus the side of the building, and what this is pretty revealing. And the construction slide, um, which was in other images at, uh, another time, you can see the different change in brick in the front to the side. So there's a very utilitarian brick they used on the side. It doesn't appear that they were locked together, spliced together, which is probably the reason why this facade is pulling away on both sides from the, from the side facades. Um, 
the materials uh, that we've used, uh, mater extra materials used in new construction should be compatible with historically appropriate materials of neighboring buildings or the district as a whole. So the, the building that we're proposing has a reddish tone brick that matches a lot of the red tone bricks in downtown Madison of the same module as well. Uh, additionally, it has um, a light colored buff brick at the fourth floor and that same buff colored fourth floor brick is virtually the same color as the post office next door and the train station across the street. So it matches, the building has a brick that matches both parts of Madison, the darker reddish tone brick as well as the lighter tone brick. The lighter tone brick in this sense we're using it because it also makes the building feel a little bit lighter as a lighter color at the very top floor. Um, other materials that we're using is, are uh, metal and glass but the predominant materials obviously in this building are going to be brick and I guess glass. Um, building elements. The various Individual elements of the building, roof, windows, doors, porches, trim, and corners should be carefully integrated into the overall design of new construction. These elements should complement those of neighboring structures. Window and door proportion size, design and pattern of spacing between openings should be compatible with historic treatments of windows and doors in this district. Uh, roofs and cornices. So there's a few of these. Let's talk about roofs and cornices. Roofs are an important part of, identi of identifying a building's historic character. Most of the structures built as commercial buildings in Madison since the last quarter of the 19th century have flat or low-pitched roofs hidden behind parapets and cornices. So these are images of several of the buildings in Madison. You can see they uh, tend to be buildings that have sort of monumental pieces at the center of them, identifying maybe the age and name of a building. Sometimes they're sort of gently patterned with little ridges and bumps. Hard to explain what they are, actually. Um, sometimes they're just a flat roof with uh, an ornate cornice. Um, and then the uh, existing uh, movie theater building today in our building that uh, is a little bit uh, reflective of some of these in total. but. Uh, we like to think it has a, an image uh, in and of itself, which is what the ordinance is actually asking for. Windows and doors. Proportion of openings within the facility. The relationship of the width of windows to the height of windows in the building shall be visually compatible with the buildings and places to which it is visually related. That's an important part because um, our building on Lincoln Place is really only visually related to those buildings on Lincoln Place, except for one other, which I'll show you in a moment. Most of the other buildings in downtown Madison are, are not, you can't see them in relation to this building anyway. You know, but if you look around, again, downtown, you see windows of certain sizes. You know, this is almost 24 square feet, this is 30 square feet. Um, next building is, uh, so n now there are buildings that are, the windows themselves are mulled together, that they are individual windows, but they are uh, mulled together without brick pairs between them. So you have some windows that might be, in a way, 60 square feet of window, right? This one is even larger still. This is about uh, 70, 78 or 80 square feet, probably. Um, the Ratty building is, again, this is just wood between the windows. So this is about 84 square feet. Uh, for this window size. Um, so the British uh, Home Emporium, uh, the reason why I would bring up this though, it's not in the district. So it turns out that if you were to, there's only one building that you could look at the back of 14 Lincoln Place and at the same time look at one building on Main Street, it happens to be the British Pine Emporium. So you could be on the right side of it and look this way or the left side you could capture the two buildings. So we thought that was an important image to, to understand. So besides it having the ABA rhythm, you know, these windows, this window is uh, 36 square feet and this is uh, 90, 135 square feet for the size of this so tripled window together. Um, this is right on Lincoln Place now. So now we're looking at, again, a group of windows all mulled together, right? This is about uh, nine, let's say 45 square feet for that cluster of windows. And then the next building is the train station across the street. 50 square feet for a window. 
Um, and then right next door, the um, post office is about, about 30 square feet for the window. So when we look at our windows in the revised building, because we've been here before, um, we have some windows that are approximately, 20, let's say, 25 square feet. This window is, let's say, five, 30, let's say, 35 square feet. So by no means are our windows larger than other windows, and if they are, they're larger than some of the very small windows, but the majority of windows in downtown Madison historic buildings are this size and larger. Okay. Um, rhythm of facade openings. So this is important because um, these buildings, which are commercial buildings, I believe, <laughs> um, they really do show how these windows, and I mentioned this before, how they go from column to column, column to column, column to column. They're uninterrupted except there are windows multi-together, multi-together with, with wood in the middle. They're not, um, there are no brick pairs between them, and there's a reason why I'm saying that. Um, this is also true with uh, the Ratty building, the same situation, uh, 14 feet of clear window from left to right. And then the YMCA building, you know, these very tall windows, 20 feet high, or the Chase uh, Bank, 17 and a half feet high. So when you, look at, when you look at our building, and now we're looking at it um, one by one, so here's uh, 55 Main Street. Again, in this building, we see what some of the designers in yesteryear did, was they took the windows and they decided to put brick piers between the windows. So they're not mulled together. Uh, there's actually a piece of, it's probably at least an eight inch brick between each of those windows. And we see that commonplace on the James building, they do it two ways. Sometimes they just mull the windows together with just a piece of wood in the center, and sometimes they put brick in the middle of the windows. Uh, and again, uh, the British Home Emporium, they do that with a slender piece of brick between the windows. So when we looked at our building, we uh, uh, liked that system, and we're using the same system of having basically a thin rows of brick separating the, the windows themselves also. So again, we're just following a pattern that we saw very common in downtown Madison. Um, now the reason why we're showing this is that we've been here a couple of times before, and we want to make sure that you knew that we, um, A, paid attention, to what you discussed with us, that we listened and went back to the drawing board and made changes to accommodate those um, concerns that you had. <clears throat> so um, this was the original building, and I won't dwell on that, but it was thought to be too open in general. So um, from that design, we began to make some changes. One, the, the windows got considerably smaller. So the windows, instead of being a piece of metal between the windows, we now begin to have brick piers between the windows. Windows are now no longer eight feet tall, but now they're six feet tall on the left and right sides and six feet 10 in the center. The windows are narrower from four foot six and five feet five in width. They're now four foot three and four foot nine in width. So we reduce the size of all the windows in the facade of the building. Um, as I said, we mentioned we added the brick piers, but we also uh, also added the brick columns as well. And the brick columns are now, you can see before they were two feet wide, they now became four feet, eight feet wide. So we more than doubled the columns themselves. Uh, the brick spandrels, so where we had metal spandrels before, we now turn them into brick spandrels. And the stone sills, we had uh, metal sills underneath all the windows. They now became stone sills beneath all the windows. So that was some of the things that we talked about at that first meeting. Um, the other thing we did was we really made the more drastic change of creating this ABA rhythm, which we talked about before. Um, and at the same time of dividing up sort of these three elements, <clears throat> the canopy got divided, so it's three different canopies now. And then the fourth story also got divided and has um, uh, the two shoulders are set back from the middle piece, uh, the center of the building as well. Uh, and then we developed a new decorative cornice uh, over the plaque that we're keeping from the original building. Um, we then did some further designs, some redesigns, and um, this was just submitted uh, in February. So some of the smaller things that we did at that point was, um, or from, uh, from, from that uh, presentation, was we uh, looked at the uh, corners, and there was a concern that maybe the corners were too, um, too much steel and not enough brick. 
So we replaced the steel with brick and heavied up the corners. Um, we uh, added a, um, a granite base on the bottom of the building. Or actually, it's, it, well, we're not sure it's going to be granite or a, a cast stone because we're trying to get the color. We are not there yet with that. Uh, so we have the stone base. And then the basic brick colors. There was a concern that maybe there were too much color splotchiness on the original brick. So we um, uh, changed that. You'll see on the rendering. It's not changed on this drawing as much as on the rendering that the brick now has less color variation and more um, continuity to it. Um, the other thing we did was that we then changed the, the mullion pattern uh, both on the bay windows as well as the center windows. So before it was a three over four module, now it's a three over five module. And the same is true on the uh, bay windows as well. And then we also thinned out the center pier on the building to give it a little bit more, I guess, softness throughout the face of the building as well. Um, so the Madison Ordinance states, it is not the intent of this ordinance to discourage contemporary architectural expression or to encourage new construction which emulates existing buildings of historic or architectural style, but rather to preserve the integrity and authenticity of the historic preservation districts and to ensure the compatibility of new structures therein. Okay. So, design modifications on the plans. Um, the original, the original uh, basement to the building, or um, parking level, uh, we thought we'd be able to get an easement with our neighbor to the, uh, to the north that we thought we'd be able to enter through the back of the building, which would have made it a little bit, a little more graceful to come in and have parking on either side. Unable to get that easement from our neighbor, we have to turn and come in to this side. So we changed the, down st the lowest level, still maintaining the 24 cars, um, but we had to change some of the, where the elevators and the stairs are a little bit, so it reflected the upper level. Uh, so on the upper level, um, the theater lobby moved around a little bit, but now we're thinking that uh, we could still, uh, I'm sorry, this is the older, um, the older plan, but because of the changed plans of the stairs and elevators, we now have a slightly different configuration of the potential theater, and it having the concessions on the left side when you walk in, and a ramp on the right side to come in for handicap access, coming in what would be to a, a, the center of the theater, and you can go up or go down at that point in the theater. And that would be a 91-seat theater in there with the nice, comfortable, plush seating that we're all sort of accustomed to these days. Um, second floor and third floor didn't really change much. It's just, um, you know, the residential units that we spoke about. Um, nothing really. The fourth floor is the uh, additional residential units with terraces on the front and the back. Um, roof plan, we have an amenity space on the roof for the tenants. And uh, this is the uh, finished rendering that we have for the front of the building. Um, I think it shows the, uh, uh, <laughs> I think it shows the color of the brick that we talked about, how we were uh, changing it so it was less um, modeled, uh, both on the red brick as well as the lighter tone brick. Um, um, and let's see, other views, maybe we'll come back. The back of the building, this shows the revised entrance on the side of the building rather than behind the building. The back of the building looks very similar to the front of the building as well. Um, the, uh, the western side is the entrance to the, um, the residences where it says 14 Lincoln Place and then if you head all the ways back you would see a, a large sign for the Lions Theater uh, in the back of the building covered by a canopy the whole way. You can go to the next one, that's right. Um, and we thought this was a terrific slide to end on because it, I think it shows this building how it, we believe it contextually fits in to what would be um, an addition to downtown Madison. You know, I, I think we recognize that every time you see something new, there's a bit of a shock. So your first reaction is, uh, oh my God, I wish I had the old movie theater there for reasons I'm not quite sure about, except that if you can get a movie theater in this building uh, and you then can um, um, sort of improve the energy of downtown Madison by creating a larger scale building to have more tenants uh, upstairs so that they can service the, um, the town that themselves, 
create a transit village building that if we're trying to create um, um, uh, a world that has less carbon footprint, then we want to bring people to live in our downtown so they can hop onto the train, they can walk to stop and shop, they can go to the drugstore, they don't have to hop in their car to go buy a dozen apples, but they could live in town. I think this building gives the opportunity to, uh, for people at all different incomes, it's a rental building, to be able to do that, to provide energy for the, um, uh, to have more retail stores and a movie theater, and it complies with the downtown ordinance regulations uh, for the historic district, as well as blend in uh, in scale and size and materials with the other neighboring buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, I guess we should start with questions from the, from the commission, um, and then from Mr. Hatch, who is our preservation expert. Um, I may start, because I've got the mic in my hot little hand. We walked through this before, and I appreciate your close analysis of a lot of buildings. I appreciate the, the movement you made um, in other designs. Why, though, when I look at the renderings, does this still look like a Chelsea loft or a factory building to me that is not resonant with Madison's very non-industrial history? Um, what, what am I missing in the design tweaking that gives me that impression? Well, let's look at the building further down the street, which is 6th Lincoln Place. Right, so that would be your typical looking residential facade. <clears throat> a brick building facade um, with punch out windows. Um, there's nothing that we find to be interesting in that. And if you were to uh, look at this building from the side view, which is you are, um, you actually now see very little glass. Some people have talked about there's too much glass, but in fact, the reason why we recess the windows, you now see a lot more brick. We actually always had that. Uh, you see a lot more brick in both the front view and the side view of the, of the brick, uh, and really much less of the window. Now, if you're saying, why does it look like this and not another building? Why does it not look like other commercial buildings in the downtown? Uh, there's a few ways to answer that. One is that, we're not asked for it. There's nothing in the ordinance that says it shall look like the following building or buildings, or shall look like, let's take all the buildings and amalgamate all of them and spit out the average of all the buildings. I think the ordinance actually suggests let's try and create something that might be a little bit different, a little bit more character to it. Um, you know, I heard someone say at the, one of the meetings, the building looks like it's maybe from Hoboken or Brooklyn. And I thought, well, those are two communities are about the most successful communities in all of America. So if, God forbid, it was so successful that it did something that wonderful, I think Madison would be very happy that it had that kind of success that, that those communities enjoyed. I, I'm not here to discuss our happiness or our, our joy enough. about this, but to stick up for the character of the Madison Historic District, which is our job as the commission. Um, the larger district represents commercial vernacular structures. There is no tradition of industrial building. An industrial loft-like building is currently very popular in Soho and mm -hmm. Chelsea and Hoboken and Brooklyn, and I acknowledge that. And if one goes down the train line, one sees, you mentioned Transit Village, you see very similar kinds of development that this is a very current architectural trope. I believe it is probably associated with some very successful buildings, but within our historic district, I'm still questioning how that supports not point by point, but the larger goal of a building that respects the history of Madison. So I have to say, I'm struggling with some of the design features about this, and, and piece by piece, I follow you. Um, 
the overall facade is a daylight factory building and and i'm i'm not sure that's exactly downtown madison so um i guess my question is in the architectural language in spelling things out are there ways to keep it a contemporary building to keep it um in we have no purview on the use so the, the uses that you wish to do that could I think it's basically around the windows still that that the windows read um, very much as a, as a clump in the middle that that look like um, not a building that has a, has a tradition in Madison. So that is sort of a question and a comment, and I'm struggling with the the language to to describe what would make this better. Um, I admit I'm struggling with that. But I think right now it's that big grid says an urban industrial setting that is not historic for Madison. Um, so let me let other commissioners ask. Can I just questions? say one thing, Janet? Yes. So, a real industrial buildings, and I can't speak for everyone, but having spent many years in Lower Manhattan, living there and working there, they are very often column to column, big spans of window. They're not often broken up necessarily by the brick piers. So we could use the word industrial, but we might be also using the word commercial for the same building type. And as a commercial building, it maybe doesn't look like other commercial buildings in Madison's downtown, but it's just another kind of building that could, you know, I, I think of this building almost <clears throat> or think about design is like the alphabet. And that is, I can imagine the Romans a couple of thousand years ago coming up with all the letters and getting to elemental P and then saying, that's enough. We don't need any more letters anymore. We're good. And someone says, well, let's try Q. Well, we can't do it alone. Let's put a U next to it or something. And, and how about X and Z? They're odd. But, you know, they'd spice up the alphabet. So thankfully, more, more character was added to the alphabet so that it became rich vocabulary. So what I'm asking the board is to think about increasing the vocabulary of downtown Madison. It doesn't have to be the same. I would say that downtown Madison is probably more tired looking than it is energy looking. I mean, just look at Lincoln Place. What, what buildings on Lincoln Place provide the energy? Not six Lincoln Place. Right? Certainly not the one-story buildings that Romanelli's are in. The train station is very nice, but there's nothing on the block. So if you look at Six Lincoln Place again, and you want to look at a building with punch-out windows and vinyl siding on the sides, what this development group said, let's make the sides of this building brick. It's, it's an infill building. It could be vinyl siding in a way, like the way Six Lincoln Place is. They've chose to look at this building as four sides, as a piece of sculpture on four sides, not the front side alone. So what we did was try to give it character on all four sides. And yes, it's maybe different than some other buildings in downtown Madison, but we thought it has enough character that reflects what is downtown to give it some more depth and breadth to the downtown. And we're thinking about this going to the future. Uh, that's why I said that statement in the beginning. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to create a historic replication of anything downtown, and I don't think we should. I don't think that any of our architecture that we're doing in general um, um, goes in that direction. We try and get a little bit outside the box, and that's what we're trying to do here. Okay, so speaking to the design and its place within Madison's cultural heritage, um, you spoke about all these unique design elements that you specifically reference other buildings within our historic district. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is I went to the Hollister Construction website and given all of the unique design elements that tie this building in with the Madison Historic District, can you explain how markedly similar architecturally this building is to the vestry project in Montclair and even elements of the Brooklyn Grand. Well, I, I don't work for Hollister Construction, and Hollister Construction is not designing the building. 
So I, I don't, I'm not sure what the but question is. But they're building pertains. the building. So I guess my question is, again, looking at the scale and the place of this design and whether it is appropriate to Madison's specific cultural heritage. So perhaps it is simply a coincidence that this is a popular style of building. But I guess my point is if something architecturally so similar to this building has a place in Brooklyn and has a place in Montclair, how can that also speak to our, I'm not going to say sleepy rural community of Madison, but definitely not Brooklyn? I, I think if you took a look at every building on, in the downtown district, I'm not sure that you can find two buildings that look alike. They no, are but so these are disparately different. Projects. I mean, we looked at. We can go through this deck, and I don't know that you want to, but it's. You'll be hard pressed to find. You'll find similarities only in the big picture, window rhythms, sizes of windows, pilasters, columns. But the cupcake building looks nothing like the YMCA building. Looks nothing like the James building. Looks nothing like. You can go building after building, and you won't find one that looks like the next building. And that's. The, and if there's any beauty and energy of downtown Madison, it's it's because there's all the differences combined. It's like a beautiful quilt all put together. Um, in that regard. So this will become another element of that quilt. I'm not asking that you replicate what's downtown. My point isn't in the dissimilarities between the buildings, but simply the similarity between this architectural style with other buildings in markedly different communities. I'm sorry, I, I didn't really get the question. In other communities? Well, no, I'm just answering back to you in your comments regarding the dissimilarity in styles. Um, my point wasn't to the dissimilarity, but the the relevance of this design in Madison bearing its similarities to other currently built projects in Brooklyn and in Montclair and in communities vastly different from Madison and our cultural heritage. I'm sorry, is that a, 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 the question is... It was. I, I, I'm really not following How, that. Well, you, you argue that this is something unique and special to Madison. We're charged with preserving our cultural heritage. Okay. I'm asking how this can help us preserve our cultural heritage, given that it would appear to fall into place in Brooklyn. I think this could fall into place any place in America, and I think it's not so dissimilar to other things in Madison. I thought that what I showed showed a great deal of similarities. Now, this has some uniqueness above and beyond all the similarities. And what I'm suggesting is that to create some more energy in downtown Madison is that we don't make every single element on every new building have to have the exact reflection of what exists in Madison. I think when they were building all these new buildings 100 years ago, if the first building was let's say the James building, did every building have to be like the James building? The fact of the matter is by looking at all the different buildings in downtown Madison, it was clear that they encouraged great differences. Does the YMCA building look like the Museum of uh, Natural Trades? Does it, do, you couldn't name two buildings that look alike, no. let alone anything else. So what I'm suggesting is that yes, this adds to a deeper character of Madison going forward. So I guess my point is simply the buildings you're referencing are typical of the character of their time in that it was different. This building, again, seems to harken back to an industrial heritage that doesn't exist. And I think we're kind of covered this subject, so thank you. Um, so um, I want to talk to you, Jeff, about one of the criteria in um, 112.7, and that's the, uh, the rhythm of solids to voids in the front facades. Um, of course, the conversation is, is um, difficult because it's not, um, it's not a prescription, but it, it, is, it is asking for uh, compatibility. So the relationship of solids to voids in the front facade of a building shall be visually compatible with the buildings and places to which it is visually related. I think we need to clarify with you that this notion that Lincoln Place is the only point of reference for your work is incorrect. That yes. the, it's incorrect that the, that the yes, entire agreed. district is your reference. Mm -hmm. The district is an ensemble that holds together as one piece. So you need to, and you've done it for us. I mean, you've shown us, you've taken us through the, the district.
and shown us many examples of how the buildings work and how you're trying to emulate that, at least with the ABA. So on um, criteria number four, the solid to void ratio is not meeting the look and appearance, as Janet has elaborated, um, of the district. The, the idea of the warehouse that has column to column glass is really more of an early 20th century poured in place concrete structure. Your imagery is more about a 19th century warehouse um, type of structure. Um, so, you know, you're emulating an historic style. You're not particularly innovating and showing some brand new approach. You're not doing a Frank Gehry in the middle of Madison. Maybe that would be of interest, I don't know. But you're, you're and, and even there, you might be able to deal with the void and the solid issue. So, um, do you feel you could do more with that relationship between solid and void? Well, why don't we look, could you go to the Ratty building, please, for a moment, the next slide. <clears throat> so, so uh, yeah, no, just go to all four of them, if you would, uh, with the rat, that one. So, Chris, I think it's pretty clear. Would you say that it's only a little bit of a push forward since stylistically your building is a late 19th century warehouse? Chris, I would like to put in a modern building. That's what, my, what I would like to do, but it doesn't allow it. So I'm trying to create a building that has a character um, that can be successful on many levels, right? And that it adds some, some more vigor to downtown Madison. Does it look like a commercial building of, of uh, 50 or 75 years ago? Yes, it does. The idea of designing anything in downtown is that it's supposed to have some reflection of what a downtown and downtown Madison should look like. Well, I think maybe to Janet's point that if, you, if you're going to, um, it sounds like you've agreed, you are sort of emulating an older look. Um, why not emulate an older look that's more in the manner of, of Madison? So, I mean, <laughs> You and I can both name modern architects who have worked with mass and masonry and stone and carved out the openings for ventilation and entries and windows. Um, modern design does not necessarily depend on lots of glass and metal to be modern. I mean, it, 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 there's all kinds of great examples, and we could talk about them together at another time. But so, why or how was it that you didn't consider a more heavily walled building? that you then carve into in a very modern way. I mean, it could be abstract. The openings could be odd shapes. I mean, we probably argue about that, but you know, I mean, this seems to have been a, a kind of a solution you came up with and 
stuck with it. So is there, was there an exploration for that more wall to window ratio? Did you think about that? Right, so the, the, traditional, um, the traditional building in downtown Madison that has obvious residential on the upper floors are punch out window buildings. Yep. Um, a lot more solid than we'd ever want to see. And the same way we want to, in the vein that we want to create the most successful building that we can for Madison and not to handcuff ourselves on any level, whether it be residential or whether it be commercial, if what we understand today is that people want more openness and more transparency, our goal was to create more openness and more transparency. Mm -hmm. Now, we could have a more modern type building with large punch out windows that would look, let's say, like the Raddy building. And I think we would probably get is, wait a second, you've gone from column to column with window, and we could have, the windows could be out at the face of the building so it looks like a punch out window. That's another style. We were not really looking to create a flat faced building. We were looking to try and create a building that has a more rhythm that looks very different head on to it as it does from the side. It changes in character because of the recessed windows purposely. It also creates a sense of privacy because now that you can't see in the windows from the side, you really only can be from across the street seeing it a little bit more right. closely. It creates a natural privacy having the recessed windows. Yeah, I mean, I, I do like um, um, some of the features of the building and I like the corner windows especially that wrap the corners. Um, that could even be seen as a 19th century element. There's plenty of examples of very delicate, light 19th century bays and extensions. So I just wonder if the front facade couldn't solidify, mm -hmm. but still hold that modern sort of layer behind it, sort of creeping in and out of the, the more solid, traditional Madison sort of masonry. I mean, it would be a creative uh, kind of project to uh, attempt that, it seems, and then you'd have, you'd answer, you'd see the both and, you know, we'd sort of answer the tradition of Madison and we'd slide this modern element in behind it and through it. It would be a more creative and a more sort of interesting proposal, I think. So if you put 10 architects into one room yeah. and you ask them to design a building, you would get over 10 designs, correct? So I, I don't dispute what you're saying. That is another way to approach the design. Um, we didn't take that approach. We could have taken a third approach or a fourth approach and yep. so on and so forth. But we took this approach for the reasons that I stated before. None of the approaches are necessarily 100% right or wrong. But we thought this was a building that would be fitting for downtown Madison. And to take the other approach that is a real interesting play of can you do a punch out window that has interesting fenestration, interesting surrounds, interesting wood window mullions, interesting everything. And I'd be sitting in front of this board and the board might be saying to me, the windows are too large and now they're at the face of the building, they're even more apparent. And I'd say, well, I guess you want to go back to Six Lincoln Place and do some punch out windows. I, I, I'd be in front of this board defending no matter what I did because what people, some people want I'm not saying you, Chris, is I want just what I've seen exactly right. like it. Yeah. I am unable to have any change in my life. And, and this is, I think, what some of us are witnessing. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the opportunities for, for an exciting sort of interaction between history or older forms and newer forms is inherent to this project. You've got an opportunity there. It just seems to me the front facade is not quite pulling it off. The, the more modern elements can remain, they can slide in and around, but it's, it's not quite there yet. I, I, I need to also ask you about another element on your building, and that is um, the cornice on the top of the centerpiece. I mean, if you're not trying to emulate historic downtown Madison, what is that thing doing there? It specifically asks that generic historic designs do not be used in the district. Uh, features such as overhangs, wood shakes, coach lanterns, or lumberyard colonial detailing such as balustrades or pediments are, prohi are prohibited, hopefully. You have got a faux cornice sticking up in the front of the building there. So now what are you trying to do? I mean, it seems to me that could be, I would advocate a more modern approach with masonry that's intersected and invaded by uh, a modern 
system within and around it. It, it, it would give us Madison and the modern you're looking for and that I also look for. Sold. Well, I'll take it. Yeah, I, 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 Chris, I, I have no problem doing this more modern, but like the side of the building is a little bit more modern than the front of the building. And I've caught just as much flack from the side of the building because it's new, yeah. too modern. So what I'm trying to say to you, it doesn't really matter what an architect will come up and show. You're going to get 20 different opinions on it's too modern, it's too reflective of the past, it's too something. No, I, well, that's I why we're here. And I understand that. I understand. But I, 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 I can't. No one can comply with everything. And if we did, it would be, let's just give you exactly what you see in downtown Madison. Well, we're not asking for that. pretend we're 1925 again. I don't want to do that. Yeah, we're not asking for that either. No, they, no, we clearly would look for a little more right. innovative approach to the front of the building. Maybe the sides remain the same. Mm -hmm. But I want to go on and ask you another question about the building. Um, the criteria um, number 10, the scale of the building. The scale of the building is another criteria we, we consider. Mm -hmm. So the size of the building, its mass in relation to open spaces and windows, door windows, porches, and balconies shall be visually compatible with the buildings in the place in which it is set. I enjoyed the presentation you made last year to us. The heights of the buildings were a good summary. Um, I checked those. I have the same tools you do, the Google Earth. I checked the heights. They seem pretty accurate for that reasonably approximate tool. I then took those heights and calculated the square footage of the buildings, the footprints, and then extruded it up to get a volume analysis. I don't, I'm not telling you that what I've done is absolutely correct. What I respectfully request is that you do a volume analysis for us so we can see the size of your building relative to the old theater, the size of your building relative to some of the other downtown structures by my initial study, it looks to me like your building is 30% larger than the theater building. You mean in volume? In volume, correct. But, but I'm not sure what criteria that is. Well, the criteria is scale of building. So your building becomes one of the largest buildings in the downtown district. And I think for that site, it's particularly difficult. There's parts of the building that are lovely. But, but I'm not sure that the scale of it is correct, and that's certainly one of the criteria by which we, we judge our buildings now, in the now district. You do, now, you do know that zoning allows a 45-foot street wall on Lincoln Place. Yeah, that's, that's, yep, that's, fine. So, that's fine. So we have very purposefully tried to reduce the apparent size of the building by several ways. One is that we remove the fourth floor off of the face of the building and recessed it back about 12 feet. Right. We have recessed the fourth floor on the sides of the building, on all both the long sides, and have done that on the rear of the building. We've taken the corner of the building that you're looking at here, and we've taken the apparent width of the building and taken off two feet on the right side, two feet on the left side, and pushed it back two feet for the bay windows and given it more light and air. So. The building is a big building, but we can't be penalized for having a large site. We would, it would not behoove the building department or the zoning department to say, you know, if you have a large site, we're not going to allow you to use the entire site because the building appears to be large. The zoning allows the building to be larger than this, you understand. Mm -hmm. We've purposely pulled it back to reduce the apparent size of it, to make it blend in with other buildings on Lincoln Place and even on Main Street, for that matter. Well, you, do, you will need a variance for the fourth floor. Yeah. So. So the other question I wanted to ask you about, Jeff, was the, the kind of urban planning aspects of sure. the district around the subject site. So one of the characteristics that I'm sure you're aware of is that the pedestrian tunnel that's part of the station complex comes right out through the, the overpass of the, of the train, right on axis with the canopy of the old theater. Uh, your building serves as a terminus to that axis but I think it doesn't do quite as good a job as the theater did in kind of collecting and representing the termination of the axis through the tunnel. It's a gateway, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say, into. So 
do you think there's a way we could move the doors um, of the retail to the middle and to perhaps signify a slight recess and maybe a real canopy uh, that has been advocated by some, including Mr. Hatch, that would actually cover some of the sidewalk and protect people waiting for the train or for people to pick them up. So there's, that's an urban kind of planning element, and it's a very significant element. That's a really special site you have there because of that connection. Right. Yeah, we can look at that to I try and get a little bit more of a, uh, a focus that yeah. aligns with the center. I mean, it really it links it into the texture of the, of the urban quality of the downtown. Right. The other aspect is the fact that Lincoln Place takes a turn at the corner of the post office and then cranks off on a slightly different angle so that the entire 30 feet of the lower portion of the existing theater is completely visible from Waverly Place. So I've noticed that your renderings have never shown us a view from Waverly Place. And I would like to see that rendering because I suspect the building will look too large. But I'm waiting for the rendering to make that call. Anybody else? Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was actually it was enlightening um, and uh, I thought very well organized. Um, some of some of my comments you've you've talked about. Um, some of the other ones, one of, one of them in particular, I, I think relates to this view and has to do with scale and, and, uh, and appearance. So, so one of my concerns, I think um, overall, I think you've addressed and, and in the previous renderings, um, the, the initial concerns I had about kind of the scale of the building and its relation to the street and to the train station. But on this particular view, um, I think the one thing that still causes me concern is just how large the um, the, t the fourth floor looks in this view, and I think it's a combination. It may be a combination of its color, the size of the windows, and then also just the way the you've um, uh, kind of separated the corner and then dropped the the um, the parapet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I was just, I guess, asking you to to see if there are ways that you could continue to reduce uh, the kind of the visual scale of the building by adjusting how you've done that so that the fourth floor um, doesn't look quite so looming in this particular view because I think it's a, it's a big view and it's probably similar the other way um, uh, that you get that same kind of impression. Yeah, I think we could do that pretty easily by raising the parapet on okay. the third floor. And that reduced the apparent height of the fourth floor doing that. Um, I also appreciate, I hadn't seen the, the earlier design, so I think the, the changes that you've made have, uh, I think, are in general are an, an improvement. I, I, I must say that I agree with the comments that, uh, although I think you make a very good case about how this relates to the other architecture in, um, in Madison, it still has an overall feel of kind of an industrial building. And that's, I think that's mainly the concern that I have is is that is that it just it just kind of feels industrial, and I think that's the part that that um, maybe causes me the most concern. I have a lot of sympathy with what you're saying, as you, you put a few architects in the room, and everybody has an opinion, and you could do do it in a million different ways. Um, but that's that the kind of the feel of it just feels kind of industrial. Um, and that what, that's what seems out of character to, Matt, to Madison to me. Um, and p part of it is also this on this view is, um, and again, I appreciate how the changes that you made from the earlier designs to this, because I, I think they, they are greatly improved or, and, and fit more in the character, but still the bay, bay window, um, some, somehow about how it completely peels the front facade from the side um, also feels both both industrial, but maybe also just like super super 
modern. So I, I'm just wondering if that, and maybe that would get resolved if the parapet continued, mm -hmm. continued around the, the, the side and, and helped to uh, reduce the scale of the fourth floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, if you've gone to the building, you may have not been on the roof of the second floor, but it's remarkable to see the view east and west down Lincoln Place. Um, yet it crawl through a hatch to get to the roof. But it's a very interesting view that one I've never experienced. And that this bay window, yeah. knowing that people are going to appreciate this very interesting view, we thought we'd take advantage of it. But, yeah. And I agree, I think it's a really nice feature for the units. Um, and maybe it can be tweaked so it doesn't feel mm -hmm. quite so large and, and mm -hmm. quite so, such a dramatic um, separation between the front facades and the, and the mm -hmm. sides. I also really appreciate what you said about that the building now has four sides, because that's really true, that the, uh, the, the movie theater is really a front facade and then a kind of a box, a very utilitarian box attached to it. So, uh, so I appreciate what you said about that. In terms of the storefronts, um, I, I also um, you know, really appreciated seeing all the, the full range of the, of the downtown um, storefronts. These still feel larger, and maybe it's that they're less detailed or something. So, um, so maybe there's some adjustments that you can make to them um, that, that just makes them feel not quite so um, quite so large and maybe quite so blank. If you could, Jeff, could you? <laughs> could I think you he's lost. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a well, password have, that we need well, to get back there. Well, you have to trust me on this one. <laughs> um, I was going to look at the front of the building, and actually there's a, um, there's a horizon line at like about 24, 30 inches off grade. Okay. And a lot of older buildings, <clears throat> they would put in a knee wall that's wood, painted wood. It, would decay, they'd repaint it, they'd refinish it. Um, but at that point in time, there used to be radiators on, on the inside of that, and there was reasons why there was always a solid wall at the base of retail buildings. Um, more current retail buildings choose to have a very small base, two inches, yeah. four inches, because you want to see in more. If you have a restaurant, you get to see the chairs. You, the, the people become more... Uh, the separation of in and out is much easier to break down, so it's a much more desirable retailer's environment. So maybe it could you know, be. We could. I don't, I don't know a, a, a mullion or a, or a munton or something that refers well, we to it, just to add some more detail or something. We, we do have that. Okay. And that could be beefed up, and we could express that more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I also think uh, Mr. Kellogg made a very good point about just emphasizing the 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 center of the center and how it aligns with the tunnel. I think that's an extra, excellent point. Um, let me just see if I'm... The, um, I, I think one of the nice aspects of this, and I think uh, Mr. Kellogg was also talking about this, I, I th if I understood his comment, um, one of the nice aspects about this is that the, is the, um, the um, is that having entries to the building and then to the movie theater along the side of the building between, between the building and the post office pro provides a really nice opportunity for kind of a, a small scale uh, but civic kind of a space. Mm -hmm. So I hope that as you get into the design that there's some more landscaping or, or maybe it's uh, low stone walls and things like that that make that a really, um, a really interesting uh, space to be and that people can uh, that are going to the, both the, the front retail and to the movie theater can kind of use that and that it's a really nice uh, civic space. Um, for, uh, Mr. Kellogg, what, what, was the, what did you say about this side entry? I'm not sure if I understood about an angle or a... I think that or was did I misunderstand? Having side entries to the retail, try and center them to the uh, movie center. Movie okay, theater. all right, that's what you're saying. Okay. The, the all right. Train station. Yeah. The retail shops are open at the very corners, so yep. by moving the entries to the center, yep. maybe with a little retail recess, you could provide a simulation, maybe, of the old theater's canopied entryway. And then, I think, to your point, uh, in your report, we also are concerned that the awning or the canopy is not providing any protection for anything. It's just a sort of a signboard. So if the awning had um, an actual cover, like that wonderful picture you found, 
with the awnings hanging out. I mean, nothing that dramatic, obviously, but it could even be fabric because that's a tradition that we saw in your photograph. So it could be a fabric system, I suppose, but something that provided that real um, protection along the street. Um, mm -hmm. Another question I need to ask you about is, is the privacy and the solar gain issues that may occur on the south windows along the front of the building. It came up, I think, from one of the planning board members last year was how are you going to maintain privacy and solar gain um, on those windows? Aren't they going to be curtained 24-7? So that's another potential issue, and I know there's answers to that, but what, what do you think uh, might happen? Well, of course, the windows are going to be the low E windows, yep. number one. And number two is that because they're recessed away from the face of the facade, mm -hmm. it creates its own shadows, both as the sun rotates from east to the western sun, the western sky, and over the, the southern sky. The deep recesses provide more shade, as you know. So we're blocking. So a window that's a punch out window has sun on it as soon as the sun touches the face of the building. Not so with this building, because there's going to be a strong shadow line created by the depth of the windows. Yeah, although so, many. <laughs> and, and like other people, they will put shades in case it's too hot. Of course, yeah. yeah. It just seems a shame to have all that glass and then have to keep it covered. Because what you're talking about, the kind of controls you'll need for solar gain control will be much deeper than your building is showing. Or that any of the buildings in the, in, I mean, some of the, some of the buildings downtown have deep recesses for the windows, but they're not deep enough to control the sun of that quantity, your windows are very tall. So the game will be there. But you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll work out the low E glass and all the other solutions, but it's an issue, I think. I'm stealing the mic. It's 11 o'clock, everyone is fading. I am very sorry to interrupt this conversation. I will say in regular HPC proceedings where we are not quite so judicial, um, this is the fun part, the challenge part. It, it is not appropriate to design by committee. It is appropriate to continue to have this back and forth dialogue between the commission charged with preserving character defining elements in the district and the architect for the project. So I appreciate your putting the time in to talk to us. We're listening to you, you're listening to us. And now I think it's up to the attorneys to talk about what happens next. It, but it, I, if I may to your point, yes. um, we have a suggestion, and that would be if uh, it's acceptable to the commission, if you have Mr. Hatch confer uh, with Mr. Gertler, um, and hopefully he can be a conduit for the comments from the commission, and they can work together to try to continue to evolve the design, as my client thinks they have been doing, uh, to get closer to, to address some of the comments we've heard. I would only have the concern, uh, it's routine to exchange basic information, but I'm a little concerned about Mr. Hatch joining in the design. I don't think that's appropriate. Well, he's made suggestions for uh, changes to the design in his memo. And, I understand, Mr. And, and Wilson. We, and we've considered them closely, and, and we're going to consider them. I understand. Consi but I think it's more appropriate the comments were made and any need for exchange of information as opposed to Mr. Hatch reviewing the design before it's presented in revised plans. So I'd prefer we talk tonight. I don't know how long it would take Mr. Gertler to come up with revisions. I'd be very hopeful we could announce a new date for the continuation of the case so that we don't have to get concerned with notice requirements while the folks are still here. Do you want to confer with your client, your architect, Mr. Gertler, and your client as to when you think you'd be ready for another hearing? Yeah, I just want to make sure that they're, they're free to talk to each other and exchange I, information. I, I made my point on the record, Mr. Wolfson. I don't want it to be any appearance that Mr. Hatch has presented this design in con cooperation, conjunction, or an endorsed design to be presented to the commission. I don't think that's appropriate. And, and that wasn't our intention. So okay. I, got I just want to stress that point. Thank okay. you. Do you want to continue the discussion with Mr. Gerber this evening, or do you want to talk about when we're going to be continuing to? We're about scheduling. Okay. Excuse me, folks. It's after 11 o'clock. Please, please, let's all be courteous. The hearing is going to be. 
please, we don't allow for bad manners or yelling. We are all respectful of each other. We're all residents and neighbors. We believe in politeness. Please, let's not have outbursts. Thank you. My, you know what my issue is, right? So I was asked to present a case about the safety of the movie theater. But we're going to continue. But she uh, came to us. I, I, I'm okay, sorry. excuse me, it's not, it's not appropriate. Go ahead. Please, please, let's not have private discussions. That's not appropriate. Thank you. So um, we we can uh, we're going to make some changes uh, based on what we think we heard, and um, we can have those in uh, within 20 days. Uh, and then, if you want 10 days, which is typical, to review them, that would take us a month out. Mr. Hatcher, are you able to check your calendar? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the ninth is fine. Uh, the case would then be continued to the 9th of April. We'd need an extension from you this evening, Mr. Wilson, because I think the 45-day time elapses on the 29th of March. Sure, we would extend through that meeting. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we'll continue this meeting on April 9th, 9th and it hopefully will be in the uh, Borough Hall, but again, we don't. We would start there. would start there. Same. If I might. Same location as this evening and the commencement of the meeting. There will be no further notice given of the continuation of this case. April 9th at 7.30. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you.